So, Berto, we, I, went with you to Colombia. Yeah. Colombia. It was crazy. And I thought that we would talk about it here on the podcast. I think we should. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. My name is Humberto Castaneda. I sell two-way mirrors. So if there are people out there uninterested in this topic, then I recommend not listening to this episode. Yeah, it would be boring if you don't want to listen to it. Yeah, I mean, it, there's not going to be any psychology. No. It's just going to be... It's parties, it's things just, on the street. Well, we're going to talk about Berto's family, which, yeah. you know, because uh, uh, I met all of his family. Some uh, wild behavior on the streets of Bogota. So <laughs> if I were you, I'd probably stop now. Don't listen. <laughs> Berto's worried about I'm a little people. embarrassed right now. <laughs> Hearing about this story that's awesome, yes. which I didn't know if we were going to talk about, but you brought it up. So. Maybe we should. Never mind. <laughs> it, it, forget I said anything. So I, I took notes while I was down there because I knew we were going to... I knew you were going to take notes. <laughs> so so, so I, I'm just going to go through the notes All here. Right. Um, okay. So just to set it up, you go. You grew up in Colombia. I did. You were born there. I was born there. I moved uh, when I was little for a couple of years to live in the States and stuff like that. But basically from the time I was six i think till i was 15 that you know that time i was in bogota yeah and uh, so like zero to two you lived in bogota yeah. and then two to f six you lived in queens off and on i actually lived from three to four i lived in bogota as well and then oh. four to six i lived in queens okay yeah and then six to 15 i, I lived in bogota in bogota yeah. and your parents were from bogota yes my whole and your grandparents family. well yeah side of my my mom's side of the family is actually from the coast. My dad's side of the family was from Bogota as well. Okay. So you go to Bogota like every year or two? Lately, last, uh, yeah, like the last six years, I've been trying to go once a year. And you go for like a few weeks. Yeah. And you have all these events planned with all your extended family. Yeah, and tons of family time. And this... Uh, event you went uh, it coincided with your grandmother's 90th birthday party yeah grandma liti liti what does right. liti stand for alicia it's like a little diminutive version of aliti like liti so may uh, you know a lot of times uh, nicknames get started by how either names are pronounced when you're little right or how little kids pronounce your name so for example my so you know she might have been Liti from when she was little, or maybe us as little kids were like, Liti, Liti, you know, like right. that kind of thing. So you were going down for that, and I don't know, six months ago or something, you, I don't know how it came up. I think I might have said to you, Oh, I want to go. Yeah. Yeah. And so you let me come with. Well, you. I was like, dude, that made me crazy because no one from this side has ever gone. And I feel terrible because I have a friend, Eric, who, for years wanted to go with me and I actually actively discouraged him from doing so. Why? Well, because I used to really... Because you don't like him as much as me. <laughs> no, like, look, I, I used to really have a stress reaction about going to, to Colombia mm. um, because it, it was a very char emotionally charged thing for me. Mm. Yeah, it's family I don't get to see, which I left to leave forever basically right and it's there's a lot of issues with my dad and the, there's other family issues and it's it, it traditionally it was very insecure like there was you know street uh, risks and things like that so so to me taking someone else felt like this super stressful thing totally and yeah. i you know even now that you are more comfortable with yeah. it apparently uh, I was thinking about it for myself, you know, if I yeah. was to visit my extended family, I wouldn't want someone, I mean, I, I guess I would put up with it if I yeah. had to, but I was so dependent on you. I don't speak right. Spanish, right. <laughs> for example. I don't know my way around. Right. Uh, I don't really have anything to do. Yeah. I don't know anybody. <laughs> so it, the for the five days or so that I was there, mm -hmm. uh, I was a complete burden, you know. Uh, you know, you found things to do that was yeah. fun for you too. But. Yeah, and and like I said, for me it was, I was now at the point in my life where I'm like, yes, great, I can now bring someone from this world down to that world. And I didn't actually feel like it was uh, foreboding or difficult or whatever. Like, it, it was... Um, obviously, it, I had to do things in a different order than I would have normally done them, but... But I, I didn't feel that sense of like, 
oh, this is such a complex trip already. What am I going to do? I, I, I've gotten more comfortable with that. Yeah. Right. And uh, so I decided to go to Denver first for a couple of days because right. I was, I, I, I have never really spent time in Denver, one, and two, because Bogota is almost two miles up. Yeah. It, you know, you have the mile high city of Denver. Yeah. Like cities in the United States that are really high are, you got Denver and I, I think uh, there's some other cities uh, in the... Right in the southwest that are really high, maybe as is, is Albuquerque. But they don't get anywhere near as high as the right uh, Sandies. <laughs> I think Santa Fe might be an out, might be a mile up. But you have uh, Bogota, which is almost two miles up, and yeah, so up up there the oxygen is something like at seventy percent or something. Yeah. I can't it's, remember. It's, it's almost nine thousand feet in the air. Yeah, yeah. And so, for example, when you climb Mount Rainier, which is which is three miles, the Camp Muir, which is at at 10, two 000. at two miles is ten thousand feet, and at yeah. that level, it's uh, considered you're climbing a mountain, and and you need right. you, you start needing oxygen at that point. You know what I mean? <laughs> if you're yeah, you know, if you're not a, like a super experienced, the uh, right, right. And so I was worried. I'd heard horror stories from you and other people yeah. about altitude sickness, right. and so I and went. It to, can't happen. Yeah, yeah. And so I I was I was concerned about being stuck in a foreign land. Uh, throwing up and right. you know not being uh, of the right mind and not being able to have fun and you know something worse than being like okay I'm a burden already <laughs> and I'm sick <laughs> yeah and so I went to Denver for two days and uh, and it, I don't it seemed to it might have helped but I didn't it have any, I didn't have any altitude sickness yeah. uh, in Bogota the only altitude uh, uh, situation I had was in my hotel when I would go up the stairs. You would feel it. Yeah, I'd yeah. like up one flight of stairs, I'd be huffing and puffing. Right, right. Yeah, that's that's what happens to me the first few days is I don't get the symptoms like, you know, sickness, but um, certainly like I'll, because I'll forget and I'll run up my grandma's stairs and then I'm like, <sighs> I'm like, what did I just do? Yeah. <laughs> The other thing that people would say is like, oh, you know, you're going to South America. Like, it must be so hot down there. Right. And, and Seattle, actually, the weather at the time was beautiful. It was like 80 yeah. degrees and like not humid. Without the smoke. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that was before then, right? Now it's all smoky. Although right now, the smoke... Finally, I can see yeah. blue. Yeah. So so if, if you're not aware, uh, there's a bunch of forest fires in, I think, the Okanagan area of, of northern Washington and, and Canada... And the smoke is blowing over Seattle, and for I don't know four or five days, the our city was like it was like heavy smog in yeah. China or something, and it was actually aggravating my throat. Oh like, yeah, dude, I got I got ill effects. Like last year when we had all the fires, it didn't aggravate my anything. But mm -hmm. this year I I was coughing. Yeah, which is like oh my god. So I I made the mistake on t on Monday, um, I went for a six mile run outside. And when I when I started running, I was like, "Why does the sky look like smoggier, foggier?" And I didn't put the two and two together. So I I did a six mile run, and then that night I couldn't sleep, and I I, I remember at like three a.m. in the morning, sort of like having a little difficulty breathing, and I'm like, "Oh, what the heck is happening with me?" And of course, it's because I inhaled like a ton of smoke. Right. <laughs> so uh, in uh, so. Leaving Seattle to go to Bogota, the weather was beautiful in Seattle, and everyone's like, "Oh man, it's going to be beautiful in Bogota, like in Colombia, South yeah. America." But weather, but Bogota, since it's two miles two miles up, right. it's it's colder, and yeah. the weather system is way different. And it was it was like Seattle in like April. Right, it was overcast right. pretty much the whole time. Yeah, it would occasionally sprinkle rain. And it was probably it gets sunny a little bit, and then it's cloudy again. It's kind of sunny, yeah. but uh, but and it was like sixty degrees, fifty five degrees. Right. Uh, so so that was interesting. Uh, but when I travel, I actually prefer it not to be super hot because mm -hmm. you're walking around a lot, and, right? You know, and I'm not a big beach person. Are you a beach person? I like I like hot weather. But do you like the beach? Nice beaches. And you like you like go to the beach and lay out and. Read, well, read a book. No. Yeah, no. Me, me too. I, I hate it. <laughs> Not I, that. I don't understand it because it's like all the sand and the wind. And yeah, the, yeah. No, I like going in the, in the water, I guess. Like, but. yeah, like you, you go into the water and yeah. you have some fun. But like <laughs> some people are like, oh, I got to, you know, it, the, the, it, in, the, in Seattle, pe people will say like, 
their dream vacation is like going to some beach, you know, and sitting and just sitting there with an umbrella. Like, it's so boring. And a drink with an umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, anyway, so let's go to my notes. So, Umberto, your dad said how you got your name. Oh, no. Yeah, right. Right. Uh, which I forget the story, but I have it in my notes that yeah. he talked about that. So I think I asked him directly right. uh, how, why he named you Umberto. So first of all, his, uh, his full name is Hugo Umberto Castaneda. Oh. So uh, growing up, everyone called him, or at least his mom, and I think a lot of people called him Huguito. Huguito. And I think he didn't like it. <laughs> like, I think it got on his nerves or something. And so he preferred like Umberto. And like people started calling him Umberto more and more. Uh, so when it came time to name me, I think he wanted me to have the better part of his name, which was Umberto. And it comes from, a, you know, it's an Italian name. There's a, it's a long line of history, I'm sure, behind the name. But there was also a king that was King Umberto. Hmm. Um, so... There was this hilarious moment that we were at breakfast and I was sitting across from you and your dad and your brother. Mm, oh so, my gosh, that was hilarious. So so uh, there, so there's you and your dad and then your brother Alejandro. Who has just arrived. Like, yeah. He arrives late. Right. And, and um, all, so, so Umberto, you are a loud talker. Oh, sorry. And, and we should point out it's, it's, my brother, but it's not his son. Right. He is my stepdad's son. Right. So it, 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 they, he know, he has met him because he met him actually two Do years ago. Do we want to talk about the connection between the dad? Yeah, we, I can talk a little bit about it. Yeah. So, so, so I learned, I didn't know this, that uh, so Umberto has parents, a mom and a dad. Surprise! <laughs> and they, uh, did they get divorced or did your mom start having an affair? Yeah, I mean, so essentially, they were very unhappy. They were fighting all the time. I think uh, my dad was, at the very least, uh, verbally abusive, uh, but potentially also physically abusive. Okay. Uh, I say potentially because, you know, I hear different accounts from different factions. But whatever the case may be, uh, my mom did start, uh, she started having an affair. And With his best friend. With his best friend, yeah. Who is also a psychiatrist. So he's also a psychiatrist. Yeah. So your, your dad's a psychiatrist, yeah. has a best friend psychiatrist. That's right. And so that led to, uh, of course, uh, bad news. And then, it, so the relationship, uh, the relationship ended horribly to the point where ne'er the two shall meet again. Uh, when they had to talk on the phone, they had to so that they could coordinate me visiting right. my mom. But so it's been like 40 years and they yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, they haven't been in the same room. They, they would never, ever be. So much so that like even the thought of of him living in the same country, like my mom hates that thought. Or he like he's like, I never want to run it. Like it's just I, I, irreparable. irreparable. Right. Like, so that leads to a whole set of experiences I had with your dad and, right. and your mom, I guess, is uh, so. And also uh, your dad's best friend. Also, right. uh, you know, these two best friends never talk to each other again. Yeah, never, never. And then your mom and your dad's best friend, they got married. They had a kid, and that's right. that's, Alejandro, that's Alejandro, who's your half-brother. Yeah. And you're a very loud talker. I am. Uh, I'm a loud talker, too. You're louder than me. Yeah. And and Alejandro is probably 10 times lou <laughs> louder than you. Which is crazy, yes. So, so he lands in Bogota yeah. and meets up with us for breakfast. And he arrives! Hey, everyone! Right, and, and we're in a, you know, it's, it's sort of a pretty busy restaurant, but not that busy. Right. He sits down and he proceeds to just scream every yes. sentence that he's saying. <laughs> you know, it's, he's announcing it to the entire restaurant. <laughs> and it's in English, so it's, right. it's probably really noticeable. Right. It's like, oh, there's a gringo right. yelling Oh, English. I see people looking over. I was watching. I was like, people were looking over like, what? Because he's also a character because he comes up. So my brother is very like ripped, you know, like he's, he's, he's in good shape. Yeah. And, but he's also wearing like gringo clothes, not like what you see people wearing. And and then he's loud and talking in English, so yeah. they must have been like, "What the heck just right. happened?" And his and his fiance is very fashionable. Like right. she doesn't blend in. Right, right, right. She has She's... bright red hair. Right. That is usually kind of 
at a bigger, you know, it's not a, she doesn't have a subdued look. No, no. She is very stylish. Very, very, uh, yes. Like, so, so, so these two characters arrive. <laughs> right. And they're just screaming, you know, he, he's screaming. <laughs> he's screaming. Yeah. And then it's, and, and I'm, and I'm, I, I don't, I'm just glad there's another English speaker around, <laughs> yeah, honestly. Yeah. And I, I wasn't really noticing that people were looking, but you no. were. And, but I'm just like, you know, I don't know. I, right. it's, I don't, I didn't really care. And then your dad, uh, at some, and your dad's not a loud talker. No. He's like, um, he's very opinionated, but he's very, not, but not, not loud. loud and he, he turns very, you know, matter of fact, matter of fact, <laughs> no, you know, and loud enough so that, cause you know, we're, we're all talking, we're all there. turns to your brother and, and says something to the effect of, um, so did he say something like, in, has anyone ever told you? He's like, so has anyone ever told you that you talk very loud? Yeah. <laughs> so he says this in front of all of us. Right, right, right. And this is like an awkward thing to like say to someone, right? Right. And kind of what people, what we were thinking but yeah, but but a different approach could have been like, oh hey, can you can you bring it down a little, or bit? just whisper to him, right? Or... But but actually, but because it wasn't just a request for him to be quieter, it was a a a, a question about his life, right? An right? announcement about you you in general. Have you been told? Right. Do you know? Have you been made aware? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, uh... and my brother brother immediately says, "Oh yes, like <laughs> oh yes, <laughs> yeah." And then you immediately say, right. Um, Dad, so 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 your dad is sitting in the middle, right across from me, and he turns to his left, yes. says to Alejandro, "Do you know?" And then you're sitting to the dad's to my to the right of my dad, right of dad, and then you turn to your dad and say, um, <laughs> "Dad, has anyone ever told you that you don't have any filter?" <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and then. And then I and then I was like, oh, I, this is a good game. Yeah, yeah. Like you know, we're just going around the table, <laughs> insulting the person next to us. And so I turn to you and I say, Umberto, has anyone ever told you that when there's tension in the room, you make a joke? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And so, uh, and I think I, I said something like, "Yeah, has anyone ever told you that you go postmodern on us?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was it was a very so so it's yeah. so again to highlight. This is not his son. No. This is his hated ex-wife's son that she had with his best right. friend. Who he does not hate. He, and he's met him two years ago, and, oh. and, and he, he feels fine about him. But, but obviously— This is, this is, this is yeah. a love child yes. of a situation that is right. quite painful to him right. on some level. Right. So to, to turn to this kid, to this kid. <laughs> and like insult— Because Alejandro hasn't met your dad that many times. Once, two years ago. Oh, really? Yeah, so like, this well, is, meaning like he met him two years ago. Maybe he saw him two— Two times or three times. So this is like the third time yeah, he's yeah. ever met your dad. Yes, 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 yes. And it, like within two minutes, he turns to him and says, "It says, has anyone ever told you?" <laughs> right? And so I'm like, "Oh my god!" And on the one hand, I know my dad, so I'm like, "Wow, that is so typical." Yeah. And then I know my brother, and I know that his reaction is actually typical, which he took it in stride. Yeah, your brother, he. He knows he's a loud talker yes. and he's fine with it. But it's also funny because my brother is also very deferential to el to el uh, older people. Yeah, yeah. And so by default, it would be very hard for him to like take offense, even if it was somewhat offensive, right? right. And like the approach was offensive. The content was accurate, <laughs> but the approach was offensive. So this was the second time I was hanging out with your dad. Yeah. And your dad kind of in a good way, I think he really targeted me and wanted to have a lot of conversations yeah. with me. His English wasn't so great, but right, so it's a little hard to understand, sometimes. but it was good enough. And he really wanted to, he's one of those guys who doesn't want to have a boring conversation. No, like he doesn't, <laughs> he, when he would ask me questions, he wasn't like, so what do you do? Or yeah. How do How's you like, the weather in how do you like, <laughs> like he, he'd just be like, like, I can't remember the questions he'd ask me or he would ask me questions about like politics and stuff. Like, yeah. So what do you think about, um, all of the horrible things that are happening in the world right now. Right. Or so, it was something very yeah. intense. And he would really be interested in what I had to say. Right. Like, I know other older guys like this, and I, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. you know, I find, and, and I found that when he crossed a line sometimes, and you would sort of put him in his place, yeah. like he would have some opinion about 
like he said something racist about a group oh, of people. Oh, yeah, because so he he has blind spots about his own philosophies. Right, right. right. So he's a lot of what he would want to talk with me about is the injustices, the injustice, right, on poor people, right, and on marginalized groups, particularly poor people in Colombia. And he was talking about how much racism there is against the natives, right? Like the the the, the los indios that they call the right. natives. So, right. So in Colombia, you have a wide variety of races. Yeah. You have uh, the Spanish descendants, such as yourself. Right. The conquistadors, if you will. The, yeah. the, the colonizers. <laughs> yes. And then you have the native Colombians. Yeah. That's right. And you have, and Which then you are, have African slaves. And right. so, so you it's have the like the equivalent a, of here in the States, you have the Native Americans. Native Americans and the, but there's, I think there's a higher percentage of Native Colombian blood. So shall we say? Yeah. Right? Maybe, yeah. Because like in the United States, there's hardly, percentage wise, there's hardly any Native Americans. That's a good point. Yes. Yeah. Oh no, actually, no, absolutely. Most of the rural Colombia is either di- at least mixed or directly descendant from, from right. natives. Right. I mean, that's my impression of a lot of Latin yeah. America. With the, I've spent a lot of time in Mexico, right. and there are entire regions where the dominant race is, yeah. na- and they don't even speak Spanish. And so my dad is very, like, talking about how much injustice, how much racism there is. But in the middle of doing all this, he starts talking about uh, the people in the coast. The, the Like, he didn't, I don't know if he specifically said did he say black people in the coast, or was he saying the coastal people? Uh, I feel like he said the coastal he, people. He, no, he Costeños. Def- no, he definitely... Or was it... It might have even been like Venezuelans. Or, no, no, it was Caribbean. Oh, it no, started... No, that's no, right. No, no, it was Caribbean, Caribbean that's which, right. which is basically yeah, black people, yeah. right? Because you're right. It started talking about the Venezuelan immigrants, right. which I thought he was going to be like sympathetic, and instead, like, we're having all these Venezuelan immigrants, and, which all of a sudden he starts sounding like, uh, they're, they're coming across our like, wall. Yeah, this was in the same paragraph. Right. As he is... Yeah, like, all uh, this like, injustice. All this injustice on poverty. Oh, and, but you have these Venezuelans coming across, and then... And you know these Caribbeans, they're all, he says, they're all the same, right? They're all criminals. They're all criminals. Right. And then you, and, and because he's an older gentleman, I mean, what is he, 75? Yeah, yeah, 74. I think and I'm in his country, and, yeah. and, and honestly, the way he delivered the racist thoughts was in such a way that I, I don't know. Kind of slips by the radar? No, no, <laughs> no, it didn't slip by my radar at all. Yeah. I was just like, whoa, did you, <laughs> did, did you just say that? It was so stark of it. It wasn't, right. a, he didn't beat around the bush. He basically said a sentence of. Yeah, they're all criminals. All Caribbeans are criminals. You know this, right? We all know this. It they're was, all It was almost like that exact right. sentence. Right, you know? right, right, right. And it was just so, ob- it was like so obviously like problematic that I just, I just sort of went, okay, I, I guess we're now talking about that. <laughs> and, and But you didn't let it go. Like, I could no, tell, I like, never let him go I could tell, like, you have a, you have an emotional reaction to that. You I know? have a parental role with him sometimes when it comes to this. Like, yeah. I have to be the father going, no, we don't say that. Right. Like, you really, like, we were, again, we we're in a, yeah. you know, social situation, have a conversation, and, like, in the middle of the conversation, you stopped and you go, dad. Let me point out what you just did. Yes, and you like laid it yeah. all out. Because and to me, I was just, I was just ready to let it go past yeah, me. Because yeah, yeah. it's like, what are we gonna do? Like yeah. educate this guy now? Yeah, yeah. And and, I'm like but, yes. <laughs> but here's the thing: like he totally changed his way, like yeah. right away. Like yeah. he listened to you, and he's yeah. like, he, he even like said, he's like. Well, you know, all Caribbeans, like he even doubled right. down. Right. He's like, no, 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 you don't understand, Umberto. What I'm saying is, is that all Caribbeans are <laughs> are criminals. <laughs> like, because because in Colombia, <laughs> it's like a foregone conclusion. It's a foregone conclusion. Like, you know, it's. I'm guessing there's a lot of that sentiment around. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Well, and, yeah. <laughs> and so it's not like a shocking statement right. to to say in his cultural pocket. But then you point it out to him very, you know, really kind of you laid it out. And he's and he was like, oh, OK, I think, yeah, OK, you're probably right. Like a most. Then he's like, most. <laughs> uh, right. Maybe maybe he did. But anyway, my no, point he is. Did, he did have a, a moment of, of self-awareness there of like, oh, OK, OK. Because uh, this has happened with him with many topics. And, and I, since I was a teenager... I stopped, like I started confronting his his extremes, you know. And does he normally react well to that? To me. To you, yeah. I'm, right. I'm a soft spot for him. Right. So I saw him, 
<laughs> as he is insulting Alejandro in front of everybody, I had already developed this idea about him as being this innocent, blunt person who doesn't really understand how socializing works. You know what I mean? Yeah. But but genuinely a good person. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and someone who has some fucked up ideas. Yeah. But who doesn't really, especially yeah. if my impression was he doesn't have a lot of enlightening conversations with people about such things no. that don't necessarily disagree with those ideas, I yeah. guess. And but I, I, he seemed like he was craving that yeah. kind of intellectual discourse. I mean, he lives alone, and a lot of people that he goes to try to talk with like this tune him out, or he flat out gets in arguments and they end poorly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I really liked him. Uh, you know, I've heard you describe him over the years, and I had a picture in my mind about him, but it was definitely not what I saw when I met him. I mean, when I met him, he's a, you know, he's a frail older man yeah. who seems a kind of um, level-headed, like emotionally. He, he wasn't, yeah. he didn't, he didn't like go up and down. I mean, there was a time when we went to that loud restaurant, the pancake place. Oh yeah. That he, I could tell he was like, slowly getting annoyed with how with <laughs> yeah. how loud the place it was right. cuz it was chaos right. in there. He starts like, "Oh, it's so so loud in here." Yeah, but he didn't, you yeah. know, he didn't make a scene and then right. as we were leaving, he said something to me. He said something like, "I don't like restaurants that are really loud or yeah, something." Yeah, like yeah. he just said, <laughs> but but he he didn't lose his shit yeah, over no. it. He didn't drive, he didn't drag anyone down with him. He just has ideas about things. All the things that you identified or saw in him that that seem positive and good. That that is very, very important to what made me who I am. Yeah. Because, and that is why I've always appreciated him. I think it would have, ironically, it would have been a lot easier for me to uh, turn down helping him years ago had I not felt like he really added a lot of positive to my life. Right. So for those who haven't heard other episodes or we've talked about this, he was a psychiatrist, and that's why you moved to Queens, because he was a psychiatrist yeah. in Queens, a child psychiatrist. He, he was uh, fi finalizing his post-doctorate in child... What is it? The residence, right? He was doing his... Residency? And at Columbia University. Oh, at Columbia. And yeah. he lived in Queens, and yeah. he commuted to He Columbia. commuted. And then uh, eventually uh, he got a post in Bogota. And and he, he actually he got offered a post in New York. Oh. But he... He decided uh, he he needed to live where I was. Okay, and which is great for me. Oh, okay, so sucks for him. But <laughs> so by then you're you had moved back to Colombia. I your, had been in Colombia for a year at that point with your mom, and he was still with, in, with my grandma. Oh, with your grandma. My, my mom lived in Tacoma. I, I only oh. got to see my mom at that point whenever I would visit her for a. a so your of dad's weeks. in New York. Your mom's yeah. in Tacoma. Yeah. Uh, with your dad's best friend, yeah, yeah, and you're in Colombia with your grandparents, grandparents. and your dad yeah. is like, uh, <clears throat> is like, oh, I need to be with my son, yeah. and so he moved back to Colombia uh, and sacrificed his career in some yeah. way. And by the way, like, why? Well, but why didn't we both stay in New York, right? So there was this pivot point where he, like, he, and I don't know exactly, but I feel like he asked me, and I actually wanted to live in Colombia, and it's no mystery why, because. Like I had so much love and family and, and support in Colombia. In New York, it was a foreboding. I liked New York, but it was a very foreboding experience for me. Yeah. It was like everything was scary and everything was like something scary was going to happen. Even though in Bogota, it was legitimately more criminal. It, it yeah. was, absolutely. But the difference is that in Bogota, I was totally insulated by my family and the love that I felt there. Right. In New York, I mean, think about it. I was literally being abused sexually. Right. I was being bullied in school. Oh, the sexual abuse happened in New in York. In New York, yeah. Oh. Yeah. So now I don't I'm not saying I put all these equations together in my head, right? Yeah. But I mean, I must have had some intuition that I was gonna be in a better environment in Colombia because he I remember him asking me, like, Well, what would you prefer? And I said, I'd like to live with my grandparents, you know. Yeah. And but and that was at the time And this was your mom's parents? My you dad's parents. Your dad's parents yeah. you lived with, okay. And of course, and my mom's parents... They've passed away, yeah. They've passed away. But my mom's parents lived nearby too, so I'd have that family too. And so this is at a time where I was being abused by my babysitter. I was being bullied at school. 
and we were, it was a stressful environment, right? And it, like the 80s, New York was pretty risky, right? And plus I lived in Jackson Heights. Like that was, so he must have also done some math in his head. Like in all honesty, I probably would have ended up in trouble, uh, be a troubled youth. You know, like right, right. in drugs, maybe, or with gangs, or who knows? Yeah, right. Having the extended family, because it wasn't just your grandparents, but it was the other set of grandparents, your yeah. cousins, your aunts. We and, had no family in New York. Right. And and so there you are. And then your dad is like, okay, I'm going to go be with my son. Yeah. He, he comes back to Bogota, and he starts to struggle professionally because of uh, you... because. You speculate because of his personality problems, he would get into uh, arguments with people at work. Yeah, I think there was a combination of factors. Uh, on the one hand, it is a fact that the conditions in those hospitals were not great. And I'm sure he identified a lot of real issues. He's also very insightful. And so he probably was right, like technically, right? Like, so he would probably have these big arguments. With, and in fact, I remember him telling me, like, he'd have these big arguments with the management where he's like, well, you can't serve this. Like, look at them. The milk is brown. Like, stuff like that, right? And and they would fire him, you know, because he'd become too much of a nuisance. Right. He doesn't have a filter. Right. Yeah. And then he would go to another hospital, and then the same thing would happen. Yeah. Right. And maybe because he had seen a sort of higher level of... Right of professionalism or, or resources, I should guess I should say, in New York. But he didn't have the neither the political acumen nor... The uh, nuanced speak. <laughs> right, or potentially the appetite for going along with a bad thing until he helps make it better, right? right. Um, Whereas everyone else would see the brown milk yeah. and go like, that's a yeah, problem. That sucks, but... Uh, but I know yeah. if I say something, my boss isn't going to like that because yeah. they're going to think that I'm right. being critical. And, right. you know. and then the, the next thing that started happening is, so he started trying to do a, a private practice, right? And then... Um, and that's really dependent on the economy. And well, there's that. Word of mouth. But I also, I think he had addictions. Oh. I don't know what. I, I have I have hypotheses that I, there was like gambling involved. Oh. Because of stories I've heard, things. There's probably some drugs involved. Oh. You know? Uh, because, like, in essence... Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. I mean, that whenever I hear stories like that, it's like... And you, there's a sort of black hole of, like, yes. I wonder what happened. It, yes. Like, eventually, if, yes. Some, if it comes out, they're like, yeah, I, yeah, was, and then like money, I was using morphine to, right. to cope with life right. and blah, blah, blah. Because money would, would just magically disappear. There was... Like whenever there's money, it would just disappear. It was just like, okay, right. there's no money. Right. So you would watch that, but you're living with your grandparents. And, and that, but, and, and him now. Oh, he's so, living. And yeah. he, so he's a child and living in his parents' house yes. and, and you're there too. And then, uh, over time, his life, uh, starts to deteriorate in terms right. of money wise. Yeah. And he has a hard time supporting himself. Yeah. And then you grow up and you become a, uh, what's your job again? Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I sell two-way mirrors, right. so it was so just quite lucrative. You got, you know, pretty yeah. successful in that, and then you started supporting him, like, yeah. pr pretty quickly. Yeah. And so you pay for his apartment, and you, you know, give him an allowance right. and all that kind of stuff, and and so that's an interesting dynamic to have. With it, it, but by the way, which started when I was a teenager, because wow. when I was a teenager living there, he would ask me for money. Wow. And, and I would get money from my other side of the family and uh, the, the worst the low point i remember is this one christmas it was my last christmas there i think he he gave me for christmas my christmas gift was three thousand pesos three one thousand uh, peso bills okay so that's like three dollars uh, no no the exchange rate was much better back then uh, but it was still i mean thirty dollars Mm, let's see if it was maybe it was like 250 pesos was one dollar so it wasn't that much money 12 dollars yeah maybe but it was for me an uh, a ton of money three thousand pesos at my age that it was like oh this is great like a ton of money as in like i i would go a couple months on that money yeah because what are my expenses like candy at the store or a pop or whatever like three thousand pesos crisp one thousand peso bills Yay. But I'm, of course I'm thinking, that's my Christmas gift? But okay, cash, sweet. But the next morning, Christmas Day, the 25th, in the morning, he says, hey, 
so can I borrow the 3,000 pesos? Wow. And I go, uh, sure. And of course, I never saw that money again. Yeah. And, and, and I had already been lending him, lending in quotes money, but this was where I really was like, oh, wow. Yeah, wait a second. <laughs> and, you know, my toys would disappear. Wow. Like I had, I had this, uh, not millenn- uh, the X-Wing fighter and the TIE fighter, the originals. Wow. They were like my prized Star Wars toys. And they were in my closet. And granted, as I got a little older. Like, like, the, like the two foot long jobbies? Yeah. I remember and the, the, the wings would detach on the, on the TIE fighter and the, yeah. the, the X-Wing fighter wings would open up. I think they even had lights and stuff. Yeah, they definitely had lights. Given to you by your mom or somebody? No, my dad. Oh, your dad? My dad. Because he, remember, he used to be a psychiatrist. He used to make good money. Yeah. I used to actually have quite a bit of toys. Yeah. Huh. Um, in fact, I didn't, well, anyways, but the point is, as I got a little older, you know, you get older, you don't always play with your toys as much. So they're in the closet. But one day I go to play with them and I must have been 12, maybe 13 or something. I'm like, oh, I want to play with my, and I'm like, where, where are they? And I couldn't find them for the life of me. I'm like, what the hell, where are they? That's so interesting because. How much money could you possibly have gotten for them? You right. Know? It's like, and so I, I, t- I asked my dad, I'm like, Dad, where are my toys? And he finally had to come clean. He's like, Oh, uh, I forget what he said, but it was like, Oh, I, I just didn't think you wanted them anymore. And I was like, I mean, I, I cannot believe. Right as I'm telling him, right, I, I cannot believe I didn't like leave the house. How I, I rationalize that into anything? I mean, I must have been irate, but I don't remember that scene well what do you do you're a kid dude that's the thing we were so i was dealing with this way early on yeah. right and so by so the that time continual disappointment yeah. and betrayal yeah and hurt yeah and you know it'd be one thing if he said son i have a problem yeah and i gotta sell your toys and i'm sorry yeah it's like, like that sucks yeah but it's another thing to have him like underhandedly do sneak it. Yeah. off and yeah. steal your shit and then yeah. sell it and then and i mean it's like there's no way on the possible planet that he didn't know how much those two meant to me right because he knew how much star wars meant to me right the only reason he picked those is because they were the bigger toys i had and could probably get Give some money two more pesos i think it's ridiculous yeah, 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 right yeah, yeah. so he had a problem that's why i'm saying it's not just that he didn't get along at work he had some set of issues that even though he'll never fully explain to me, the closest he ever came to telling me is that he he had young girlfriends and that that spent a lot of money. And so I'm like, okay. But I think that he had a lot of a set of issues. Hmm. So I do know that he, you know, because he never brought any women around the house. So he might have had a couple of gold diggers, but gold diggers out of nothing because he didn't have gold. So whatever. Long story short, when I grew up, uh, you know, for the first six years, like I didn't really wouldn't have even been able to help him at all because I'm like in high school here. I like, what am I going to do? You know? And I didn't see him. I didn't go back to to Columbia. But then when I went back, he certainly asked me for money and I didn't have much money at all. And then when we established more of a contact and then things like Western Union was like a thing I could do, then it would be like, oh, can I, I just have this. And I was like, okay. And I started doing that. And over time, I'm like, I I was like, I should say no. And unfortunately, this was when he was still young enough where it was completely fine for me to say no. But in my head, I couldn't say no. And then that evolved into me just paying for everything. When my grandma died, and he was basically going to be homeless if he didn't live somewhere. I'm like, I guess I'll just make a deal with my aunt. I'll pay her rent. And then uh, I guess I'll send money for his. I like So then I just became the com- complete 100% support system. Does he thank you for it? Yeah, but he will never, ever come out of the, of, you know, this is not something he's going to come out of. Yeah. I've even suggested because for years, and, and this also goes to like how little I understood how much he could have done for himself because I, I was much younger. So in my mind, when he was in his 50s, I thought, well, I mean, he's in his 50s. What is he going to, right? Whereas like, I think I'm like, I'm almost going to be in my 50s. 
Uh, no one's no one's gonna be supporting me. Like what the right? Yeah, I mean he he could have got a job at a pizza he joint. He could jo- work right now. Right. So he, his older brother, the post office or right. something. His older brother, oh, I don't know if you met Jaime. I don't know if you met him. His know. older brother works at a. He's got a little farm. He goes and he he works and stuff. So my my point is like. I had this delusion that, oh, well, he can't work. So I have no, he's just going to be homeless if I don't help him. Right. Yeah. And so unfortunately, I became the, the enabler in that situation. I wonder if he's still using whatever his problem was. Um, the one thing I'll say is uh, two years ago when he had his, uh, he had this prostate removed and he basically died on the operating table. It was, you know, he, he was really bad. He, he was dead for like two minutes or something. Oh my God. Like serious. And, um, he changed a lot of things about his uh, patterns and behavior. And so I will say this time when we saw him, he seems the healthiest I've, I've seen him in a long, long time. Huh. He seems like, because he's eating really carefully and healthily. He's not unfortunately able to walk much because his feet really hurt, but he's trying to stay active. And if there were times in the past where I would visit and I'm like, mm, you're doing something. Yeah. It was never like, oh my gosh, he's on heroin. He can't even lift himself up. It was never that extreme. But it, like I remember one time he, I was, uh, this was many years ago, but he left the house. This is back when my grandma had died. So uh, he was still living in that house because they hadn't sold it yet. And he left. He's like, oh, I'll be back. I'm just going to go find some cigarettes. Uh, I'll be back in like, you know, five, 10 minutes. And he was gone for like an hour. And when he got back, he was like flushed, like sweating. And I'm like thinking, so were there no cigarettes? And he's like, oh, you know, they ran out of cigarettes. I'm like, so I remember like, okay, that yeah, was yeah. something. Interesting, yeah. yeah. Right, so I knew about, I don't know, 10% of this. Yeah. And so there I am hanging out with you and him. Yeah. And just seeing the dynamic there was really interesting, you know, and just seeing right. the the way you were basically his dad. Yeah. And he was um, trying to just have good conversations, but just trying to go with the flow, too. He, seemed, right. he seemed quite jovial, you know, a lot of the time. And I got to offset, because I've mentioned this before, I think, uh, but like, because I, why would I be still so affectionate towards him and stuff? The, the one thing he did always have is he really cared about my person. In other words, he would talk to me. He would listen to what I was dealing with. He would um, sit down with me and we would paint together. Like he spent a lot of time with me mm-hmm. and I always felt like I was the king of the world as a result of that. Mm. So it was like this weird mix of like inability to handle his life and then therefore handle my life financially and things. But he was very much there for me emotionally. Yeah, I mean, that's the cycle that I see with addict parents who have enough attachment, secure attachment from their childhood that they can give some secure attachment. But they will cycle between uh, neglect because they have to uh, feed the beast and feeling terrible about it and trying to make up for it. Right. And uh, so there's this, and the fact that their life is in such shambles, they have a lot of free time because they're yeah. they're not working. That's a great point. And so, I always did have him around. He was always around. Right. So <laughs> so there's this weird combination of lots of attention That's and, right. and, and maybe like showering you with attention because he felt bad for disappearing for a couple of days or something. That's really interesting. Um, you're right. Because like, first of all, he never did disappear for days. He was always there. But... Or uh, feeling bad that he couldn't support yeah. you or something. Or. So I, you know, a lot of people were like, oh, I never saw my dad. He was always working. <laughs> it's like, I have the opposite. It's like, no, he was always there. Yeah. And not in a bad way. Like, I literally had my dad anytime I needed him. Yeah, I mean, the stories you've told <laughs> in the podcast before about his parenting style seemed, you know, real, really good. Like, he, he, you would be caught in a lie and yeah. he wouldn't flip out. He'd just be like, so what? what's going on with that one? Yeah, yeah. You know, and you would freak right. out and he'd be like, okay, well, let's talk about that and right. you know maybe don't do that again why you know and you know it was really great all right well let's take a break and we get back let's uh so we've got to just two points <laughs> on my notes what do you say bro yes all 
right, we're back from the break. If you haven't become a patron of the podcast, do so now. Become a patron, and uh, you know you get access to hundreds of premium episodes in which we do deep dives on various different things. Go to patreon.com, become a patron of the podcast. That's I, I get an email every time someone becomes a patron of the podcast, which is a great feeling. I'm yeah, sure. <laughs> every time I get a little email and it says, you know, so and so has become a patron of the podcast. Right. Um, uh, now on the other side. I don't get an email when people unsubscribe. Oh, I see. <laughs> so I'm always just like, uh, the numbers are similar to last month. Yes, I, I remember like you know a handful of people, and so anyway, uh, which That's is fine. Nice. You know, you can you can comment. Some people join and unjoin and come back. And oh, know. I've done that with things I support because we don't always have money lying around to support everything, right? right. So right, yeah. all right. So uh, okay. So as soon as I land. I uh, start interacting with your family. Yeah. And and right away, um, first off, I can't remember anyone's names. Because, <laughs> you know, they it's Colombian names. You know, right. if it was like Jack and Sean and, right. you know. It's like Herman, Tati. Yeah. This is like, yeah. you uh, know. Right. Adriana. And it's not even Tati. It's like Tatiana, right? Tatiana, yeah. Like you said Tatiana. Adriana. But it, but then everyone said, oh, Tatiana. I'd be like, well, who's Tati? Oh, that's Tatiana. And plus you have quote unquote cousins and aunts who aren't really related to you. Right. And so it's like Tati, this is this is my cousin Tati. But yeah. I mean she's not my cousin, but right. yeah. And so uh, <laughs> there's just a whirlwind of all that. And then immediately people are asking me, uh, how long are you staying? Oh yeah. That's and, and again it's it's all in Spanish. <laughs> so because like your family oh, uh, the very few people who speak English speak it very uh, loosely, not right. very well. Right. So and I don't speak any Spanish. <laughs> right. And so it's all kind of translated. But anyway, everyone's like, um, so I'm like, so we landed Tuesday night, I think, right? And I was leaving Sunday night. Right. I was leaving Sunday at midnight. And so I'm like, oh, you know, my flight is uh, Sunday midnight. You know, and to me, I'm like, that's, you know, five, six good days. And Everyone was like, oh, you're leaving so soon? And to me, I'm like, you don't even know me. I could be an asshole. Like, <laughs> like you might not want me to stay very long, but he, that's what everyone said. But, and I've sort of thought of it as, oh, they're just being polite. You know, they're right. just, just uh, oh, that's so soon. You know, that's what you say. Like, if I said, I'm leaving, I'm, I'm going to be here for two months. Oh, you're leaving so soon? Because, you know, you got to say that to, to yeah. show that you appreciate. <laughs> it's sort of like when someone has a new haircut at work. Like you, you gotta say Great it looks haircut. Yeah, you, oh, you got a new haircut, or nice. or did you get a new haircut? And the person says yes. You can't just go oh and walk away. Oh, too bad. I miss your old. Haircut. <laughs> yeah, you gotta say it looks good. Like even if it doesn't, you just gotta say it. And so I'm gonna try that at work. Like, oh, what happened? Yeah, you cut your hair. Yeah, or just be like, or just be the. No, here's better. You just walk up. Did you get a haircut? They're like, yep. And you're like, hmm. And you just walk off. <laughs> like, no opinion. <laughs> anyway, so I thought they were just being polite. And I thought, that's really nice. But it got a little heavy. It's just like, they, everyone. <laughs> everyone. Yeah, oh, you're stop. leaving so soon. Then you and I go out, just you and me. We go to uh, this. Oh, by the way, sorry. I was there for three weeks. Guess what? You're leaving, you're leaving so... so soon. Yeah. Same thing. And to me, I'm like, I, and what I kept telling people was like, well, I have to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like, and I don't have any family here, so right. it's kind of a miracle I'm here to begin right. with. You know what I mean? So anyway, uh, uh, but anyway, I thought you know it's yeah. nice. Everyone's being polite. <laughs> then you and I go out to a bar, just you and me, and beer station. Yeah. Beer station. It's sort of like an American style, uh, be, like a, like diner, yeah, like a sports bar kind of thing, yeah. But they're playing like uh, music videos on the screen, yes. American music videos, and some gems too, like eighties stuff. Yeah. yeah, and these two drunk guys, uh, Colombian guys, are you know they're sitting pretty close to us, and we start watching them hit on girls. Yeah, in in the bar, and we're like, oh god, and then just seeing them just and then they crash and burn on the one sitting next to us. Yeah, they it was, but it, you know, anyway, it was it was comical to watch, yeah. and and it they let it kind of drag on for a while. And then somehow uh, you ended up sort of, you know, getting involved in the conversation. Yeah. And then they came over and started talking to us. And then we had this whole conversation. They right. were Colombians who lived in America like you. Oh, one of them lived in Aust Australia. Oh, Australia. Yeah. And the other one was like in Miami or yeah. something. Florida. And, and they were visiting Colombia similar to you, That's old right. friends. 
And I, again, they're like, oh, so you're visiting with Umberto. You're a gringo. You're an American. Yeah. You're visiting. Uh, how long are you staying? And I'm like, oh, you know, my flight's Sunday night. And they're like, you're leaving so, so soon. soon. <laughs> and I was like, wait a second. You guys don't even care. Like, yeah. what? <laughs> so soon. And then I, then I started thinking, people don't travel to Colombia for short periods right. of time. Like people, it's like your family. Yeah, yeah. So so it's like your one chance every five years yeah. to see all of your family right. in Bogota. Because I have a feeling like people don't move out of Colombia. You know, like the people who live in Colombia, I've been guessing a lot of them have lived there for a lot of generations. That's right. Similar to your family. That's right. And so people, and, and also Bogota isn't a, you know, it's not like Cancun or something. No. It's it's a place where people live and work, and there's it's a big eight million person city that doesn't have hardly any tourism. By the way, you know right. what I mean? Like that from the tourism that we saw, right? Uh, which I think was mostly Bogota people who were tour <laughs> touring there. Yeah. Um, I I get the impression like they're not used to people just visiting for a weekend. Like right. if you're in Vegas and right. you're talking to a bartender and they're like, "Oh, when are you leaving?" and you're like, "Tonight." They're like, oh, "Okay." Like because cool. Vegas, you just so kinda... soon. Yeah. <laughs> and so so I was so I was wondering if like it's so weird for someone to go to Bogota for five days. Well, yeah. First of all, that I mean, because like I said, this happens with my friends with everyone all the time. I think people there just are used to. Well, if you're going somewhere, you better be there for a while. Right. Like my grandma, when, this is one of the things that she gets into trouble with my mom is because my grandma will want to come here. And in her mind, she's like, I don't know. I'll be there for, I don't know, not long, like two months. Yeah, yeah. Right. And my mom's like, uh, no, that's not going to work, you know. Uh, so for us, like two weeks is like, that's a long time. Right. Because the idea is, is like, if you're going to go and you're going to spend the money, right. y- you might as well make the most of it and right. stay a long time. Uh, but for me and my sort of middle class American <laughs> way of thinking, it's like, I'm going to, this year of 2018, yeah. I'm going to go on, you know, four different trips. Right. And, so if you're spending a month everywhere. Right, I, I wouldn't, it's not possible. <laughs> Uh, but I'm guessing for people in Bogota, they might go on a trip once every few years or something, yeah. you know, and so you might as well stay a while. Anyway, yeah. um, another one here, let's see, Umberto giving money and then saying he's going to come back after being, oh, so, so do you <laughs> oh want to tell God. the story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, let's take a break actually for a second because I have to go to the bathroom. Okay. <laughs> All right, we're back from the break. Along the lines of the patrons, we I just got an email that Lauren became a twenty dollar patron. Wow! And welcome, Lauren. Lauren, if Lauren lives in the North America, I will be able to send Lauren a mug in the mail. But if they don't, then tough beans because it got, I I th- to to send a mug to like England for example I, I th- it's i think it's like 150 bucks or something it's like insane just send the cash <laughs> yeah. uh anyway so yeah okay so i i think i would like to tell this story because i just love this story so much all right <laughs> okay so we had been planning this uh paint the town night Friday yes. night. We, yes. We, all the cousins, we, we were all going to go out and go to like what I, what I was calling the douchebag district of, of, <laughs> of Bogota. It's where all the douchebags go, you know, it's like, you got all the clubs all, right. and they're just, they're just side by side. Right. You got club, 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 mm-hmm. you know, with the, you know, the oons, oons, oons music or mm-hmm. the salsa, salsa music or right. the merengue music or uh, or American music, I suppose. And, uh, very lively, a lot of people on the streets. And so we end up in this one club and there's this live music and it's sort of, I sort of thought of them as like the black eyed peas of Colombia. Yeah. You know, they have different singers and they're amazing dancers and do lots of different kinds of songs and they have videos at the back and it was just this really great time. And we were there pretty late and had some drinks and we're, we're out on the, on the sidewalk now at like three 30 in the morning. And a lot of people at this point are on the sidewalk trying to get it's packed. packed. Like yeah. s- stop it and not even stop and go. It's stop. <laughs> right. It seemed like the decided point when an, at least a certain population of the people decided to go home because yeah. all the street singers are out, like get trying to get money. Right. And there's just like a, just mayhem on the streets and, and I, I took a picture of you with them. I, I, if, so if you go on Facebook, you might be able to find that. But, but 
so before leaving, you had talked about how you told me, so don't ever take a cab. Right. Be- Not on the streets. Right. Because cabs, there's a, you know, a percentage chance. It's small, but it's, it's significant enough that uh, of them actually being in, in lieu or in league with criminals, yeah. they'll, they drive you out to some, there's some word for it, right? Like yeah, Paseo Millonario. So it's they, a, the millionaire's trip. Okay. So they take you on the millionaire's trip and they take you to the middle of nowhere and then they take your money and they, yeah. just, they just leave you there. Right. And so instead you said always take an Uber right. because an Uber for whatever reason, you have to register your name and, yeah. you know, and your bank account and stuff. And so if you do something bad, it, there's a chance that, you know, you could be, uh, you know, crim- you could be caught for the yeah. crime. And so, so we're out on the street and there are, uh, we're trying to get an Uber and, but the, the traffic is so bad and there's so many people out that, and, and there's such chaos yeah. that we can't seem to find, find Uber. Like we're both like looking for the license plate. Like right. And, 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 and I'm getting tired and I'm just like, I just want to get home. You know, right. I'm just like, oh, it's so late. And then at some point this, these guys, and then at some point we're like, well, maybe let's just take a cab. Right. Like it's probably okay. Yeah. And cause we just, we got to get home. Yeah. And so, uh, these, so this is where I'm, I need to get off of the story train because I didn't see this part. So two yeah. guys came up to you, right? So what happens is that there are, uh, people on the street that are trying to get a little cash in various different ways. Like you said, there are singers, there are people like, you know, just like trying to help you get in the club or whatever. Well, some of them are trying to help you catch a cab. So in particular, in, in hopes for a tip, in hopes for a tip. So in particular, these two, they're like, oh, here, do you guys need a cab? Come over here. And I'm like, well, we're trying to take an Uber, but we can't find it. And they're like, oh, no, of course not. Don't take here. This cab's right here waiting for you. This is all in Spanish, by the way. All in Spanish. And they're, the two of them look like, you know, street. Not like, They don't look like full, like decrepit or anything, but they definitely look like they've been having a little bit of a rough time, you know. Right. And they're just trying to get some money. I'm like, all right. So I'm talking to them. I'm like, all right, so this cab's good. I'm like, oh, all right, all right, all right. And so I pull out a, a 20,000 peso bill. So by the way, we should mention, if you don't mind, you are extremely intoxicated. I am extremely intoxicated. Like on a scale from one to 10, you're probably like a nine at this point. Yeah, so. it's bad. Yeah, like one of the drunkest states <laughs> you've ever been in kind of. But, at least, but I am not in the, um, which I, luckily I haven't been in a long time. I'm not in the unaware or passing out or you, you know, remember the, i remember but, all of this yes but but you were significantly but I was significantly impaired. like your brain isn't working right absolutely yeah yeah so i pull out a twenty thousand peso bill which is uh seven dollars seven dollars yeah so i'm like all right uh thank you and which, i give it which, which is a big deal it's a big deal to them it's it's a oh, it's seven dollar tip like imagine on the streets handing out seven dollars to someone that's more akin to in the states like a twenty dollar bill probably. yeah or yeah. even more i would imagine so i yeah twenty thousand and i give it to one of them I'm like oh thank you thank you and then i see they start fighting over it like literally like the other guy starts trying to grab the bill like they're they're not coming to blows but it's it's getting physical and so I'm like, no, no, no. And then I pull out another 20,000 pesos. I'm like, no, no, no. There's two of them. It's fine. We got more of these. Like, and so I'm like, oh, okay. And then they calm down. Had you been handing out money to other people on the street at that point? Were you giving money to, to the musicians? I, I had given a tip to someone that told me where there was a cash machine. I might have given a tip to the musicians. Yeah, I, I remember the next day you were like, yeah, I, I was my just, money. I was yeah. just throwing money out yeah, yeah. on the street. I like, did end up with a deficit of how much money I thought I should have had left in my wallet. <laughs> so anyway, so you give these two guys 20,000 so pesos. Each, right? And, so and like, they both oh, are trying to get you and I into a into cab. cab. Right. Now, at this point, one thing that's going on in my head is the the version that's going on in my head if I were sober was... Hmm, I'm a little concerned about taking a cab on the street. Uh, I wonder if I should say something or try to make sure that this is okay. That's the the sober version. But you're worried that the cab is going to take us on the million, yeah, right. millionaires or ride. It's not going to be safe in some way. But what? But then it gets translated in my drunk mind into, okay, I have to take extreme measures to guarantee our safety here. So in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, I know. I've got a brilliant plan. 
I know for a fact these two are in direct cahoots with this taxi cab. And there's a high likelihood we're going to get killed. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to scare them so badly. So you're convinced that these two guys who probably don't even know each other right. are in league with the cab we're about to get into. Right. And they definitely don't know each they other. They definitely don't know each other. And they are definitely these three people are have have conspired. They've to, conspired and to, we're, to not only steal our money, but we're to, gonna get killed. to kill us. Yeah, yeah. And the answer to that is. So then, I, I my plan is I'm gonna scare them. So I'm, I so so that they actually <laughs> take us home. Yes, and don't kill out us out of fear. Of they what, they, yeah. they switch f- their plan their of plan. kill and rob to. Yeah. He uses his high tech little communicator device that they have. Don't kill this guy. Yeah, hey, not this guy, not this guy. Okay, so yeah. what was your plan? So I, I am sitting there laughing with them like, ah, thank you. you know, And then they're happy because they got their bills and still smiling and laughing. I look at one of them straight in the eyes and I go, now listen, listen. <laughs> if he kills us, I am going to come back. And then I lean in and I kind of get a little quieter. And I go, I make an X sign with my hand on his chest. I touch his, I go... And I'm going to cut you. And then I'm going to eat it. I'm going to eat your flesh or whatever. And then the guy, and all of this in Spanish. And with a smile on my face, looking straight in his eyes, the guy's expression changes instantly into like this confused look like, what? (laughs) And then like, all right, have a good night. And then we get in the cab and drive off. And in my mind, I'm like, accomplish the mission you're like <laughs> mission accomplished he's we're good we're off we're fine because he's gonna use his communicating device and be like hey hey hey, not these guys these guys we, we gotta let these guys go right and con- contact you know a li- little bit of context as well is you were dressed nice yes and you were throwing money around yes so <laughs> so you kind of look like a gangster at this which point. by the way i hadn't even in my mind i wasn't like oh i'm gonna try to appear like a gangster but but now that looking at at it from the outside looking in, that is very well likely what went through his head. Like, oh God, it's a mafioso. Yeah. You know, because like who looks at you in the face and says if, by the way, the supernatural implications of it all, because I didn't say if he tries to hurt us, I'm going to come back. I said, if he kills us, I'm going to come back (laughs) and I'm going to cut you and eat you. Like what? So yeah, it was. uh, I love this story so much because well, first off, the next day, you know, you're hungover and you're like, oh, you're not going to believe what I, <laughs> what I did. And the first version you said was, I, I told a guy I was going to cut him. Yeah. And then like. Uh, uh, that was li- bad enough. That, and I'm laughing at that. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, yeah, yeah. what? And then like a couple of days later, we're telling the story again. Yeah. And you're like, well, wait a second, Kirk. I have to tell you the full story. <laughs> yeah. Not only did I say I was going to cut him, <laughs> but I also said I was going to. I was going to eat. <laughs> And then, you know, the, what was going through my head in that moment was the American Psycho scene where he's like, I tried to cook a little, you know? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so if you're a patron out there and you happen to run into Umberto, just walk up to him. And so the way with your hand is not a finger, but no. all four fingers. All four fingers. As if, you're, as if your hand is like a karate chop. Yeah. And then you go on, on the a, chest. A, an X, right? X on the chest. Right on the sternum. And you say, I'm going to cut you. I'm, yeah. It, if, if, the, if this cab driver kills me, I'm going to come back. I'm going to cut you. Yeah. And I'm going to eat it. And I'm going to eat it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's, which, the, that's the way to avoid trouble in life, for yeah. sure. Not I'm gonna kill you, not not just I'm gonna cut you. No, but I'm gonna cut you. Well, I don't want to kill the guy, and then I'm <laughs> gonna eat you. <laughs> so yeah, no, just do that in general to anyone, and you'll never, you know, it'll it'll be fine. It's, it's fine. <laughs> so good. Um, all right. So then, uh, oh, another story here that you about me saying I'm just looking in a store. Uh, if you want to he- see that full story, uh, go to Facebook, our our Psychology in Seattle page. I uploaded a video of me telling the story at the live events, like a five minute story I tell. And so, if that's the so, if you want to know about that little bit, go there. Um, also, oh, oh yeah. So another thing is is no English speakers at all. So you know, all right. <laughs> I, I haven't traveled a lot um, until kind of recently. In my older age, I've I've 
suddenly sort of liked traveling. When yeah. I when I was younger, up until I was like 45 years old, uh, I was like kind of medium on travel. Mm -hmm. Like if I traveled, it was usually because someone was dragging me, you know, with them or something. Right. But then I went to Santorini in, in the Mediterranean, Greece, right. and had such a wonderful time that I, and Athens too was really great, that I was like, huh, I guess if you, if you really lean into the travel process and, you know, mm -hmm. decide where you're going to go, research it, figure out the best things to do and really kind of take ownership of the trip, right. you can really have a great time. Uh, and then a little bit later, I went to Paris and London and same process, like spent like a year sort of researching all the different things you can do and just had a, this great time. And so, uh, but in those, in those times, like I never bothered to learn the language, you know, mm. in Athens and Santorini and Paris and strangely in London, there's enough people that speak English, you know? Yeah. And, uh, Sometimes it, it'd get a little hairy, yeah. but I was always in my head, I'm always like, okay, I could spend three years trying to become fluent enough to have a conversation or six months to say like a few phrases and sure. maybe half the time have it be understood because of the accent problem, you know? Right. Or I could just have fun and like have those few moments where the, <laughs> you just have no way of communicating with someone, yeah, yeah. but it won't be a disaster. Well, that was my whole attitude going to Bogota. In fact... I had to be reminded how to say thank you. It'd been so long since I'd been to a place that spoke Spanish. I, I spent a lot of time in Mexico in like the, the aughts, so it's been yeah. a while. But anyway. Oh, by the way, in my mind, I was like, oh, no, there's plenty of English speakers there. Because two reasons. One is a lot of people go to bilingual school. Like I went to a bilingual school, but right. And two, in my mind, I'm like, I never have a problem communicating with anyone. But But obviously... That's a that's a ridiculous statement because I speak Spanish, right? But it makes sense to you because you don't necessarily differentiate between right. Spanish and English. You, right. It's just you speaking. Yeah. And so you're like, well, you know, and you probably, I'm guessing, kind of identify now as a foreigner when you go back, right? It's just like you're- Yeah. You're and, like, I, and I think of like, you know, my aunt uh, Maritza, she speaks, my, my cousin Andres and Sergio, they speak. So in my mind, I'm like, you know- People speak. My dad speaks a little. Like it's fine. Yeah, your dad. Your dad was was doable. Uh, yeah, uh, Andreas. Andres. Uh, Andres was really good. Yeah, and Sergio was really good too. Yeah. So yeah, you had some some pockets, and in my mind, I just amplify that to like yes, there's plenty of. But speakers. those are two people among probably <laughs> like thirty people in your family who I talk right. to, who and so there were other people where. Oh, oh, there and, was no communication between me and them. You know what I mean? And I thought, well, because you were staying at the hotel my mom recommended. Right. And I'm thinking, oh, they, there's pli they probably speak English at that hotel. Right. And they don't. My mom speaks Spanish. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm at, the, I'm at the hotel and I'm checking in and, you know, they start. So the whole thing is I don't know how bad it is because right. they're speaking Spanish to me. They could just be saying something like, oh, you're checking in. Yeah. Or they could be saying, by the way, there's a killer behind you. Like, <laughs> like I have no way of knowing, am I missing something important or right. not? So, so then uh, when I'm checking in, it got down to basically us just saying like one words to each other and not really understanding 90% mm -hmm. of those words. You know, like yeah. he, he eventually he just pointed a thing and I think it was like sign here. That's the thing. I didn't even know the Spanish word for signature, which right, I think is what's it, firma or Fir something? Firme. Firme. So eventually I learned that. It's like, oh, that's where you sign. Like saying firme is meaning like, Go ahead and sign, like sign. Okay. Yeah. So credit cards, it was the same thing. I was right. like, there's like a bunch of lines at the bottom. I'm like, I don't know which one to sign, you know? Oh, yeah, that's true because you got you should got to put your ID document and, like your document ID. Yeah, like, it's like four lines. And I'm your like, phone I, number I, and I, your, yeah. I don't know. And and so at, at my hotel, uh, just trying to check in, trying to order room service, because that's the other thing. It was like, well, if my hotel doesn't speak English, <laughs> then certainly the you know, the the restaurants in this area probably don't speak English as well. So I better stay here and right. eat breakfast, but I need to order it over the phone. And that was a whole comedy of errors. <laughs> you know, trying to I order something imagine. over the phone, you know? Wevos. Uh, so, wow, that's going way too far. Egos. Egos. <laughs> uh, Burgero. You know what I mean? It, it got it got really bad, Burgero. I'm not even joking. Oh, my gosh. It, it was... It was 
it's comical. <laughs> it, it got to a point where, like, by the end of my time being in the hotel, that I would just bring the menu downstairs and, and po- point and point at something, and even then. They would say something. It's it, the whole thing about Bogota that I realized was like a lot of people were very confused that I didn't speak any Spanish. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? I don't think they ran into a lot of people that just don't speak any Spanish. Who don't speak? And so they just m- most people they just kept speaking Spanish. To Assuming me. like at some point you'll get it, right? <laughs> yeah, they they would just they would just keep repeating, and I would just keep looking at, and I I was one didn't know the phrases or two was too unconfident, like. I should have just learned phrases like no habla espanol or pardon, pardon? Perdón. Perdón, no habla espanol. Perdón is like sumimasen. <laughs> yeah. I'm very sorry. Yeah. I don't speak Spanish. But I was so insecure about my Spanish that I just would kind of smile and like, eh, you know. <laughs> anyway, so that so that was pretty rough. Um, another... another. Uh, sorry, it's probably similar to uh, every now and then I'm in a... Uh, Chinese restaurant where um, the the people serving actually do not speak English. Yeah, and but the, there's someone in the restaurant that does, but whoever happens to be serving at that moment really doesn't. And I'm trying to say something, and they're they just not understanding. And in my mind, I'm like, what is there not to understand? I'm being so clear, right? But of course, they're not understanding, right? right. And it's probably a similar frustration on their part. Right. They're like. How many, I mean, I'm telling you what you need to know, but you're not listening to me. And you're like, I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> right. I, I, and I got the looks on their faces were, it took them a while to really let it sink in like, that I didn't understand any anything. Spanish. Yeah. You know, like there wasn't, there, right. there wasn't a single word I got in right. anything they were saying. And I think it took them a while to really feel that. that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so another thing I noticed was, how in Bogota, the uh, loud music thing. So um, so my first experience with this was when uh, we first arrived. So we arrived Tuesday night and your, your quote unquote cousin took me to my hotel. Yeah. Uh, Tati. Ta- Tatiana. Yeah. And Tati. uh, hermano. Her- Herman. 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 And uh, and they don't speak any any <laughs> English at all. Right, 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 right. I forgot about that. <laughs> so they're so they're. So I handed you off to. Oh yeah. my god. So I get in the back seat of their car. It's like an <laughs> SUV kind of car. Oh my god. And they're uh, they're playing music, and then they're trying to communicate with me something, and then um, and I'm trying to make conversation with them, kind of. Yeah. And then uh, celebrate by Cool in the Gang comes on. Oh right. And. And I, I don't know, I try to say something to them. I'm like, this was my very first cassette tape that I got when I was a uh-huh. kid or something. And through that, we started, we both started kind of singing the song. And then they just cranked the music. Oh, no. Which was fine. It was yeah. good. But yeah. to me, I'm like, like, think about in your head, listeners out there, think about being in a car and think about super loud music <laughs> and like double that like <laughs> oh my God. there's there's super loud music in a car and then there's what herman and tati <laughs> oh no and it and i was like and it was it was ear splitting music <laughs> for like 20 minutes <laughs> oh god and and they're totally calm you know they're not partying you know they're not drunk no, they're no, just no. driving down it's and it's probably like 1 in the morning right yep. now you know um <laughs> And then there were several other instances like that, like um, when we went to that apartment with uh, the Cuban singer. Oh, yeah. So so uh, Umberto's grandma was having this 90th birthday, and so we needed to audition this singer yeah. for, the, for the birthday party. We were treated to a private concert. Right. And so we went to this guy's condo across town, and a small little condo. And, you know, it's, uh, the windows are open because he wants mm-hmm. it to be ventilated. And there's a PA system that this guy is singing through, and it's loud. Yeah. And so eventually I left uh, before you guys left because I hit a wall and I need to yeah. go home. I'm out on the street, and, you know, it's quiet, uh, s- sort of bur- urban street, sort of like think like Belltown, Seattle or something. And it's, I think, probably one or two in the morning or midnight right. or something. And the music coming out of the condo, which is above us, like, like <laughs> on the fourth floor, is is blasting. <laughs> I mean, it is just like, 
you not only can you hear the music, but you can hear all the drunk people screaming, right. you know, in this in this condo. And I look to you because you're saying goodbye to me, and I'm like, I'm like, dude, don't you think you should close this window? And what did you say? <laughs> um, maybe I said like, oh, this is just like par for the course, right? Or you're like, just like, oh no, this, this is, is how it's. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm like, you're like, this is Columbia, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, well, doesn't anyone get upset? And he, you're just like, no, everyone expects that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like, if you had that in Seattle, if someone was blasting music, right. like the cops would show up. Which, by by the way, my dad, that's he hates that. He's always complaining about loud neighbors and stuff like that. <laughs> but the other thing was. It wasn't like there were other neighbors making music. No, it was right. just it this guy, yeah. but somehow like that's okay. But anyway, that was a so there were a number of instances like that, like other um, Uber cars I would get in, the mm -hmm. music would just be loud, just like you know, twice the loudness that you would expect someone to have. Right. You know what I mean? Um, the other thing I noticed was oh, or the, the music at my grandma's birthday party. Oh my god, was loud. Yeah, I just kept cranking it yeah. up. You know. Oh, and the. When we saw the Black Eyed Peas, Columbia, yeah, that that was, was loud. That was, like when, like we show up at like eight thirty or something, yeah. and you know we're thinking we'll have a conversation. You know, we're not ready to like dance or anything right. yet, and the music is so loud we can't have <laughs> yeah. we can't have a conversation with each other. Um, the other great thing about Bogota was it, Ubers. So, so there's terrible traffic in Bogota, right? Yeah, and. Even if you just have to go like three miles, it's probably like twenty five minutes. Yeah, it's bad. <laughs> it's sort of like Seattle, but like at its worst, and yeah. and there's no good highway options. That's right. And there and and the cars, as most places around the world, actually, aside from the United States, there's no such thing as a lane. You know what yeah. I mean? Like everyone just kind of crams in, and they make it work. And yeah. and no one's really no one gets upset. I mean, the things that routinely drivers do to each other in Bogota there would be a road rage murder in Seattle yeah. if you did that in Seattle. Like, totally. Like the the cutting off of people. But it, I don't know, but people eventually make it work. Anyway, I was just very impressed with Which, that. By the way, one odd thing is uh, I always notice way less accidents there than I yeah. do here. Now, when there are accidents, they're usually lethal. Because it's like some bus careening down some hill and killing a whole bunch Well, of that was the other thing was that <laughs> The traffic is going so slow right. that accidents probably aren't that bad, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and you have, like, motorcycles weaving in between the cars. Right. And, but, like, it, everyone knows how to... It sort of works. Like, yeah, and the cars are smaller, too. Yeah. Like little Fiat kind of cars. That was the other thing. There's a lot of Chinese-made cars in Bogota. Tons. Like, like, in the United States, I don't know if I ever see a Chinese... Like, a Chinese-branded car. Right, you know? right. Um, but anyway, a cool thing about, so I, so I'd get in my Uber and I'd be, you know, okay, we got 25 minutes. Um, I'd get to the end and then, you know, I'd see the charge. It would be like some thousands of, of pesos, <laughs> but then I'd make the mental calculation in my head, a dollar 50. Yeah, totally. <laughs> like a dollar 50 Uber ride for like 20 what minutes. What does that get you? <laughs> yeah. I was just like, oh my God, yeah, you know, it's crazy. And then yeah, yeah, it was just like so convenient. Right. <laughs> just like anytime, anywhere. It's like if I lived in Bogota, I would never have a car. It's no. just like just Uber everywhere. Yeah, every time I go there, I Uber constantly the whole trip, and I never get back and like, oh, how did I spend that money? <laughs> it's interesting. I, I met one Uber driver uh, when I wasn't with you. He was from uh, Venezuela, and he uh, he actually spoke English pretty well comparatively to Bogota people. And he was talking about how uh, Venezuela, the economy, isn't doing as well as Bogota is. Right. And so to him, Bogota was definitely a step up. And and he was really happy to be in Bogota. And when I told him I was American, he was like, oh, I would love to live in America. Oh. Yeah, I was just like, yeah. and, I, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm thinking, you know, in a few days, I'm just going to get on a flight and I'm just going to go, go back, right. I'm just going to go back to Seattle. Right. And the customs person is just going to wave me in. Yeah. And this guy can't even get in for, yeah. a, for a vacation. Right. You know, like he, he, and he, he just wants to go there and, and he would kill just for like a shitty job in, yeah, in totally. Seattle. And, and I, and it just, you just feel, so he felt like he was stepping up for Bogota. Right. And he was desperate to go. I mean, it was just like this stark example yeah, of yeah. like the privilege that we have in the United States. Totally. Um, 
And he and his, uh, so his parents were both professors of engineering in, in Venezuela. His two brothers and his sister, all engineers, he's an engineer. But because the economy is so bad in Venezuela, he's an Uber driver in Bogota. Right. And he's happy about it. And he's it, happy, right? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, that's one common thread is uh, like there, most of my friends down there are way more educated in terms of numbers of years of schooling and everything than most of my friends here, including me, <laughs> you know? Like it's it's very common for, for someone to have like – PhD level credentials, uh, sometimes two degree, you know, stuff like that. And they just don't necessarily, are, they, they're not necessarily able to work in their field. Right. Because the yeah. economy is such that, that they're just, there's just not a lot of opportunities. Yeah. And so you could be, you know, wonderfully positioned and qualified for a job, yeah. but they're just, they just aren't out there. Yeah. And that's something that you just don't really feel in the United States. It's like, if if you get a medical degree, for example, and you're right. you know halfway good, like you'll get a job as a medical professional. Yeah. If you get a, an engineering degree and you're halfway good, like you'll right. you'll get a job. At a, you know, it might not be the best engineering right. job, but you'll get an engineering job. And obviously, a lot of it has to do with the fact you know Colombia's got maybe thirty million people, so it's a less than ten percent of the size people wise. The country is much smaller, and also a lot of the country is not habitable easily you know it's like jungles and very inaccessible regions so there's very dense cities like bogota and in those cities well-connected people or people that come from long lines of families with money and stuff they do very well right like there's probably richer people living in bogota than there are in maybe seattle or at least equivalent you know yeah because there are just those very, very ultra wealthy. But then the majority of people, you know, they struggle. Right. Another thing that I ran into was that when I would uh, talk to random people and or people who weren't, who didn't necessarily know that I was coming with you, they would ask me, um, why did you come here? Like, yeah. there, like a lot, it was the same similar thing of like, people don't go to Bogota for vacationing, you know? If I show up in Miami Beach and, yeah. and I'm like, oh, I'm just here for a few days. I'm from Seattle. No one's going to be like, why? Why did you come <laughs> to Miami? Like I would, I would say, you know, I'm, I'm here for five days because people would be like, do you have family here? Do you have work here? And then yeah. they'd be like, well, why did you come here? Yeah. You know, and I'd just, like like, yeah, yeah. I'd just be like, yeah, I'd just be like, I think Colombia sounds amazing and Bogota, you know, yeah. sounds amazing and I want to go. And yeah. it is just a very foreign idea to, to a lot of people. Right. Um, I had a wonderful conversation. So your grandma, Liti, doesn't speak English very well, like a couple words, yeah, you know. Like very broken. Yeah. And so one night while you were off doing something, I was sitting with her and I busted out the Google Translate app on my mm. on my phone, <laughs> and they have this they have this function where you can press a button and you speak English into it, uh -huh. and then you press another button and it'll and the phone will speak Spanish. Right. And then we so me and your grandma went back and forth <laughs> for a while about that, and it felt so good. That's great. You know, I felt like Babblefish from uh, yeah. Hitchhiker's Guide. It was really great. Um. Oh, another note here. Uh, the disapproving kitchen helper. Oh. <laughs> so you have this, uh, so your grandma <laughs> has a, uh, like a maid or a kitchen yes. helper. And she, uh, when I walked in and, you know, there, I was introduced to her, she just looked at me with like this, like, like it was unmistakable <laughs> uh, scowl. Yeah. <laughs> She, she just looked so, at me like... She's so much like that. What are you doing here? Yeah. Like, who are you? Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, but I feel like over time, I, I won her over. Yeah, she does that to me. Because <laughs> I'll be like, I'll go for a run. You know, I'll put on my like jogging or whatever, and I go for a run. And she's just like... She gives me that same look like, are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but that was also interesting to see because, you know, in the United States... If you had someone who had basically a maid, right, like a servant, in it's your, like rich people's, yeah, yeah, which 
arguably your grandparents are on the scale of things. They're 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 uh, yeah. I mean, at least for most of their career, they were probably upper middle class. Right. So, yeah. uh, you know, their house was pretty big and yeah. a nicer part of town and that kind of thing. Um, and, but it would, but I will say it was very, very common even for middle class to have mates. Is which that is, be, yeah, is that ahead. because they're the poor class is so poor? Yes, that's can, why you can because you can basically them pay them nothing, almost nothing. Like a lot of times, it's like they get to live there, eat. So they're like, yeah, they get like a little tiny stipend, maybe. Yeah, yeah. So it's sort of like indented, you know, yeah, indented, right. sure. Yeah, uh, we had like for example in my house, uh, we had very little money. We had maids, not. There was a point at which we no longer had mates because we had no money. But <laughs> was that the house that you showed me in that neighborhood? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. um, that neighborhood didn't look very good. It's it it got really really bad over the years. Yeah. But compared to where your Leeti lives, like obviously right. Leeti was in a nicer neighborhood. Right. Yeah. When when uh, my grandparents first moved there, obviously eons ago, that was the most northern part of the city. Everything beyond that was all prairie. Mm. So they lived in the nicer part. <laughs> Another thing about your grandma's house is that it reminded me of my grandma's house. You know, mm -hmm. my grandma passed away a couple years ago, 101 years old. And when I was at your grandma's house, because she's 90 and your grandpa's like 92, 92 or yeah. something. And the way the house smelled, mm, you know, just that constant food smell yeah. and lots of things being chopped and, yeah. and soaked <laughs> and prepared, you know, it's just like, yeah, it's yeah. just this constant sense of like <laughs> food in process, yeah. you know? And, uh, the, and your, the way you described your house, you were like, okay, here's this room and here's that room and here's this room and here's where everyone hangs out. Yes. <laughs> and, and it was this big kitchen and you, and you pointed to everything. You're like, this kitchen doesn't look very up to date. It looks kind of, you know, shitty or whatever. Yeah. But the stuff that comes out of this kitchen, you know, it was <laughs> yeah. the same with my grandma. I mean, her her kitchen was pretty janky, you yeah. know, like because they were poor and they couldn't afford, um, you know, nice gas ranges right. or anything <laughs> like that. But it didn't matter because the, you know, you just it's about preparation and the yeah. right ingredients and how to make food and and uh, so I was legitimately taken back. I didn't expect that to my grandma and, and that, and that felt really good. And, and also the way that your grandparents and your cousins and aunts like accepted me into your family. Like I, I felt t embarrassed at like how much attention they were giving me and, right. and, and how nice they were to me and how every food item was like Kirk first, you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> and like, Kirk gets the most, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and your grandfather, uh, he uh, has uh, dementia and, and he's a super nice guy. Yeah. And he, I could tell he had a certain value of like, uh, treat your guests well and right. also kind of a masculine bonding thing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he, whenever... Whenever he was around me, I could tell he was like really making sure I was happy. You know, like he kept right. looking at me and like, is how's Kirk doing? Does he need food? You know, it's like, yeah. and he would remind me, it's like, tell Kirk that this is his house. Right. There is no protocol here. He loves, there's no protocol here. Anything he wants, like, this is his house. Right, right. <laughs> and then you would translate that to me. Yeah. And then I would have, to, and then over time, uh, <laughs> we became so friendly with each other yeah. that we would hug like every three minutes right like, like he would just turn to me and we just lock eyes yeah, like, oh. and then, and then I, we, we do full-on hug yeah, you know yeah. and and uh and he was he's like a real a thin kind of wiry yeah probably like five six or something uh you know a very just he looks like a very distinguished yeah man. but he comes from tough stock because he's from Guajira, which is like this coastal region. He is very native, actually. Like, like isn't he half native or something? Or is he full native? I don't know. I mean, like, when you look at him, he looks pretty... He, he doesn't look like a white person, yeah, you know? darker skin. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and they're tough. They're tough people. Like, they, they had a, a rough existence, yeah. you know? So so that brings me to another thing that I, I wanted... But so anyway, that was great. And the, your family was great. You were great. Um, I, I felt so embarrassed and, like 
terrible that I put everyone out in that way. And, uh, uh, and, but man, just the feeling, cause like when I was younger, that's what we would do. We go to Spokane and that's right. where my grandma's house was. And all the aunts and uncles and the cousins would be there and grandma would be at the top cooking of in the course. kitchen and all, you know, it's just like that, that activity that you guys had in that house, you right. know, it's just like, it, it's just like that whirlwind of, What's going on? And yeah, jokes and yeah, oh you, yeah, yeah, and it's like okay, let's feed him, and then your de- your grandpa would come around the corner with right. a, a guardiente, which is uh, <laughs> it's it's look li- it's look li- liquor that's yeah. made out of anise, which is anise and sugar cane, yeah, which is like uh, it tastes like licorice. Yeah. And it was pretty smooth, actually. Yeah. Like it's it, not like because a lot of times when I say you know if if people don't like Jägermeister or there's a, what's the other one that's uh, pretty strong? Like, oh yeah, the, yeah. What is it's the other nowhere one? near. Like, it's a lot smoother than that. Right. So, uh, like Goldschlager, I think. Yeah. So, right. 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 Yeah. It's um, yeah. Like it's more like sake, like a good sake. Yeah. Or with 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 it does have that licoricey taste. But for example, but you can drink uh, Guardiente straight and not be like yeah. totally like knocked out. You yeah. know what I mean? Like one of my good friends there hates licorice. But yet she can stand aguardiente. You know? Right, yeah. It's a very slight yeah. licorice smell, yeah, or taste. And he would walk around. Right, he'd walk around. He, so he has aguardiente in, in this little pint glass, a pint bottle. And then he has like an assortment of shot glasses. Which we've all gifted him over the years. Okay, yeah, it's like a New York one, yeah. like like ornate shot glasses yes. with like metal things coming <laughs> off of it. And like every once in a while, he'd just come around the corner and he'd be like, Da, 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 da. Ah, yeah. And then we'd all take a shot, and and you don't like taking shots. And, I like sipping aguardiente, yeah. right? And so, so like, um, you would just kind of take a sip. I could see you kind of being like, okay, if I sip this, by the next time the next I might shot still be sipping. Come around, like I'll still be working on this one, <laughs> and like your cousins would make fun of you. They'd be yeah. like, come on, come yeah. on, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so all that was great. Um, uh, what was I gonna say though? Uh, about all of that, I was heading in a direction. Well, because he, he, because he, he, he would do it every time he saw us for a while. So yeah, it's like... but I, I was going some other direction with it before, where I was talking about your family and what it was like to be there. Well, anyway, yeah. Um, another interesting thing I remember was the there was guards in your neighborhood. Yeah. So the uh, the celadores. Yeah. It's, so think of so people out there think of like your your very typical kind of urban suburban neighborhood where it's close to the city or even in the city like Ballard if pe- people who live in Ballard it's mm-hmm. it feels like that where the houses are pretty tight tight together yep. not very much yard but there's individual homes yeah and there's not a lot of traffic and there's a park down the road where kids can play and there's you know swings and stuff and so you would think yeah it's it's not you don't think of it as a gated community no like in this, like in Seattle, we have gated communities, right. and these are like, you know, they're typically attached to a golf course, and the gate is like it has a guard station, and it's like impassable gate. Yeah, yeah, it's it's almost like a like a compound with a yeah. huge wall that spans the entire thing, you know, right. and there's no way you can get in, and and uh, whereas these, so your grandma lived in what is a gated neighborhood, but it's a very um, unassuming gate. Yeah, and there's just a tiny little guard guard house with a guy yeah. inside, and you told me that like the guards will work there for years. You yeah, know, like decades. I mean, I've known the same two guards for as long as I can remember. <laughs> right, and and what I was thinking was, and because I've always thought that, because like for example, in Ballard, there was a problem with a lot of break-ins while uh-huh. people were at work and stuff, and I was like, what if? And and there's this that neighborhood app or that neighborhood uh i think it's just called like neighborhood or mm-hmm. do you know that website it's, where you can a neighborhood watch or something like that? well it's right. it's a it's like facebook but for neighborhoods where yeah. people can post like i saw a sus- suspicious right. character and da, da, da. and so what i thought was like why not just get a, a few blocks together and everyone chip in i don't know like a dollar a day and for, uh, you know, and if you spread that out over 50 houses over the span of like a few blocks, that's, you know, that's $50 that you can, well, would that be enough? I guess you'd have to pay more than that. Anyway, my point well, is, is- if it's for limited hours, like like you're going to watch for certain hours at night or something like that. Right. Or, yeah. Right. Um, 
or maybe you expand it out a little bit more. And anyway, my point is, is that I was, I was always thinking, why don't little neighborhoods get together and just pay for a security guard to right. roam your neighborhood so that right. no car break-ins, no, uh, no break-ins on houses, you know, much less likelihood of that happening. And that's what they do in Columbia, yeah. which I find to be extremely intelligent to do. Right. That's right. Now, most, uh, most of the city is now becoming buildings, and every building has a, a gate and a guard. You right. Know? Well, it's just much easier, yeah. you know, to, to be secure around. Um, yeah. Another thing in Bogota that I didn't see that I heard about was that in parking garages, that when you pull into a parking space, there's a light above the part, like up high on the ceiling that changes from green to red. Right. So if you enter a parking garage, you don't have to search for a open spot. You, you just look, green. you just look for a green light. Yeah. And if you don't see any green lights, then you know you have right. to go up a floor or something. Like I find that it's, it's like why efficient. don't we why don't we have that in in, in the states? Yeah. There are little optimizations you can find there that they're like, oh, yeah, why didn't we do that? It'd be so easy, just a little LED, right. you know, with a little sensor. You yeah. know, it's it'd be so simple. But you know, um, let's see. Uh, oh, we went to a mall, and I felt like I was in America. The mall was yeah. The malls have gone. Very, very Americanized over yeah. the years. The mall feels exactly the same as an American mall, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> except different, for, to some extent, different stores. Yeah, I mean, it's it's even got some of the same stores, but it's, all, it's also got some that are from there. Yeah. Um, all the Renaults, you know, or all you right. call them Renaults. Renault. <laughs> which are a, a French car. Yeah. In the United States, uh, I think we call them Renaults in the United Renault, States. Renault, yeah. Yeah. Um, in the United States, you'll see one Renault every 10,000 cars. <laughs> but in Bogota, like every other, every car, other car was is. was a Renault. Like lots of Renaults, yeah. Fiats. Um, Mazdas. Uh, but tons of like, uh, like you said, Chinese models that I right. didn't even know. And, right. uh, so growing up, Renault was definitely very popular. Also, they have a factory. I don't know if they still do, but they used to build them there. Oh. And <clears throat> so I learned to drive on a Renault. Oh. <laughs> A uh, great city for bikes because it's a plateau in the middle of the mountains. And so uh, a mesa or whatever. Yeah, so you can and, bike everywhere. I mean, there's places where there are hills, but um, very easy for bikes. Uh, I thought it was very clean uh, city, very clean. Which, by the way, that that is true now. And it was a result of a, of a sort of civic campaign that started in the 90s. Uh, to late 80s, early 90s, the city used to be an absolute mess. Mm. And people started like this campaign where it was not, uh, we should have more money for paying people or for paying the garbage collectors. It started being these ads where it was like, ponga la basura en su lugar. And it was like pointing fingers at all of us. Like, it's your job. It's all of us. We have to clean the city. And I think it worked over the years. Yeah, I mean, I didn't see anyone cleaning. I just, it was all... It used to be, the the, the culture was, you ate something, out. you just throw it. Yeah. That was the culture when I when I was there as a kid. Yeah, I didn't see hardly anything. I mean, there was graffiti, uh, quite, I, quite a bit of graffiti, but Seattle right. has a lot of graffiti. I remember my, like, my dad spent a ton of time educating me against that. Because like, he had spent some time in the States. And so he would be like... No, and so every time I like I would throw or he would see someone, it's like no. So I would I, I learned like no, I pick it up, I never throw it, and and it was an uncommon thing. I always thought it was like oh yeah, my family does this weird thing where like we don't throw garbage on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I found it to be very safe. Um, there, I mean, it felt safe to me. The neighborhoods I was in, yeah. anyway, and I was in quite a few neighborhoods. I felt yeah. like we went to a lot of it. Yeah, we we stay as long as you stay up kind of north northern parts it, it tends to be fairly safe i mean i would see women walking around in my neighborhood at like one in the morning by themselves yeah and it essentially be like in the middle of the city right um i went into uh, a couple of grocery stores and was amazed like this there was one grocery store i went into by, my, ho by my hotel that was better than any american grocery store i've yeah. ever been to <laughs> like the the produce was better picked, uh, the selection, uh, right. the vibe of everything. I just, I was like, man, this is some but that, nice So that's one of the funny things when my grandma's visited and, and she's like, okay, let's go to the grocery store so I can buy some stuff. She, 
in my mind, I'm like, oh yeah, wait till you see that. But she's always massively disappointed and can never find the things she needs. And so then I'm always embarrassed. I'm like, oh, oh, well, we could go to a different place. So it's okay, grandma, we'll find the ingredient. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and I found this true in Mexico as well. Is and I'm guessing it's because labor is cheap. Is that the service and the cleanliness and the organization is so much higher because you have so many more people working there. Right. Like even in the grocery stores, every aisle had a worker who was either randomly there or posted there yeah. to help me with something. You're right. It's it's there are ironically more low end jobs because. People can get can get paid less, I guess. Right. You know, when yeah. we would go to a restaurant, there was never a time when you had to like chase down the waiter or something. Like, like remember when we went to that Japanese restaurant? It was like yes. a fan. Our waiter literally stood right next to our yeah. table. She she stood. She just stood at our table yeah. waiting for us to do something. Yeah, yeah. Like that. We were her only customers. That's right. And and I just remember thinking, and it, but it wasn't intrusive. It was yeah. just like. Good service. Well, we never want. Yeah. Uh, and and then do you remember the restaurant we went to where they had the masks? Like they were all wearing like yeah, the yeah. mask and the gloves. The seafood place. The yeah. seafood place. Yeah. Right. Oh, that was another thing. Like their hairnet game is on point. Yeah. Right. In Colombia, even the waiters have hairnets. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and like not terrible hairnets. Like you know, yeah. kind of fashionable hairnets, if you will. Um, there are no hipsters. I like, saw. In... Like you didn't get food poisoning, for example. No. Yeah. I ate. I mean, the amount of things that I ate in Bogota, seafood, beef, pork, uh, raw fish, right. yeah, it was, you know, it was fine. Um, and the water in Bogota is it's cleaner clean, than yeah. it is in the States in some ways because yeah. it's run off from the mountains. Yeah. Um, in Bogota, no hipsters, no tattoos that I saw, no right. weird haircuts. Everyone, that's what I found was true in uh, Paris and also in Greece, was that everyone knows how to present themselves. Now, you could say the opposite thing of like, no one's original and no one's expressing sure. themselves. But like, there's there's no look that bothers me. Do you know what I mean? Like everyone right. has like just a real nice, nice haircut, yeah. a, a nice shirt, like a actual kind of dressy shirt. Like no Very one's- cosmopolitan. No one's a schlub right. in Bogota. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like everyone is like business professional, yeah. you know, as they hang out. That's uh, why when I arrive in my shorts and my T-shirt, my grandma freaks out. She's like, ah, gringo. <laughs> yeah, because in Seattle, like, everyone is dressed like a schlub and or they are expressing some massive individual fashion choice. You right. know what I mean? And it's just like it's lots, of, which is great. You know, I mean, it, I, it's, it's its own thing. Yeah. It's its own thing. But at the same time, like, there's something right. nice about going to a place and like everyone is just, you know, they're not trying to stick out, I guess. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that's what it is. I don't know. Um, there was no Diet Coke. There was only Coke Light. I find that to be true around the world. They don't, they don't have Diet Coke. They oh, have, really? It's always Coke Light or Coke, oh, Ma weird. Coke Max or something. Um, let's see. What else? That. Oh, that crepes and waffles place that we went yeah. to in the mall that we talked about, the super loud place that your dad didn't like because it was so loud. <laughs> Is a wonderful. So it's called Crepes and Waffles, and yeah. it's this chain in in Colombia. Yeah, in Colombia. And the mission is to employ women who are in a bad place. Yep. They uh, might be single moms who are abused, and they're running, or they're extremely poor and trying to raise their kids or they have some disability or something. Yeah. And so all the workers there are these um, marginalized women. Yeah. Yeah, often darker skin, and uh, and it's super popular because it's you know it's crepes and waffles, and yeah. so I'm in this restaurant. And it's yummy, <laughs> yeah, and it's and it's good, yeah. And I'm in this restaurant, super popular, you know, just like right. every table completely packed, and they cram everyone in there. Yeah, um, nice, you know, it's sort of like it looks like an IKEA on the inside, like very yeah, modern. Right. And I was thinking, like, if you had this restaurant in the states, like it would make a killing. Gangbusters, yeah. I mean, just crepes and waffles. That's a done deal right there. Yeah. But then a social justice right, thing right. about it, like that. Yeah, come on. Um, oh, I know what I wanted to say. Um, after a while, I started, I, I don't know why it took me so long, and you tell me if this is rational or not. I started realizing that to some extent, I was like the only American American around. You know what I mean? Like I was the only, I was, I, I started realizing in some contexts, 
it was very clear like, oh, that's an American. Like all of us are Colombians. Mm -hmm. That dude's an American. I see. Like they, they never said that. Yeah. But o over time, I like when we were at the the Cuban singer that, you know, the, a friend of a friend's condo place. Uh -huh. you know, remember that night? Yeah, yeah. Like people were extremely interested in my experience of that whole thing. Right. Like I just wanted to- the foreign right. entity. Yeah. But I was also, I mean, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, like not just a foreigner, like a Venezuelan or a right. Cuban, but I was like an American. An American, right. Like an, a gringo who doesn't yeah. speak Spanish. And I started thinking that people started making guesses about who I was and what my personality was. So I that, guess it, that would make sense. I guess it bears kind of going into a little detail here. So we go to this. So Berto and I go out on. Um, I'm guessing it would have been. Uh, yeah, it would have been Wednesday night. We go out and we order these large drinks, and it's like a it's cabeza like, de jabalí, which means boar head. Okay, so it's the it's the Colombian um, electric or Long Island iced Long tea. Island iced tea, which Long Island iced tea in the United States has like rum, vodka, whiskey. Uh, right. You know, it has like it's a disaster in a in a yeah. cup, and. The, and in Colombia, they have all those liquors, but then they add like they add more. <laughs> they have like brandy, <laughs> aguardiente, a, a yeah. yeah, and and, and it's it, a big, it's like this big punch bowl type, <laughs> right? So if you want to see a picture of that, go to our Facebook page, and we drink that whole thing, and you know, I'm I'm buzzed. It at, tastes like juice too, right? Yeah, it's just like <laughs> yeah. So the next day, so then that's Wednesday night. So then we're planning to paint the town red Friday night, right. and so this is Thursday night, and so I'm like, I'm not gonna drink, I'm not gonna. A party. I need to like. I want to experience this Cuban mm -hmm. singer, which is amazing. Like a private concert. This is going to be amazing. I'm going to sit front and center, and I'm going to experience this thing. But I'm not going to get drunk because <laughs> uh, I, you know, I drank last night, and we're going to drink tomorrow. Right. Uh, but uh, but you went full bore that night. I was like, how does this? How does this guy do it? Like every <laughs> night. Um, anyway, because they start offering us. It's not like they're like, do you want water? No, they're like. Here, here's whiskey. Here's no, it's rum. It was oh rum, right? It was rum. Yeah. Here's a here's a glass of rum. Right. And we have five more. And uh, they keep just filling up your yeah. rum. And and uh, the owner of the condo, our our host, was extremely blitzed. Oh yes. At, like annoyingly so. At like one he was point. he was gone when we arrived. Right. Well, and, I noticed when he arrived to get us from Liti's house, he was holding a glass of rum, <laughs> like in his hand. He was like a. He was like the dude from Big Lebowski, oh, you know, traveling with his with, with his, his white Russian, you know. That's hilarious. And so, um, so he was uh, anyway. So at a certain point, so I'm I'm the sober one in the room for the yeah. most part, <laughs> and everyone else is getting escalatingly drunk, and, and the host is like off the charts, and they start. And by the way, all the songs the Cuban singer is in Spanish, right? And he's singing songs that you guys all know. And you're singing along. So right. by, so at a certain point, like an hour in, it's basically a, 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 karaoke. a karaoke session. Like he's, a, he's playing songs and all of you are just yelling these songs <laughs> out. And I'm like, this is great, but I don't understand. I don't recognize these songs. I don't know the tunes. I don't speak Spanish. You know? That's a good so, point. So I'm just sitting there smiling going, yeah. this is amazing, but yeah. you know, I, I can't get into it if I knew any song. Yeah. So, so, uh, at a, so uh, then your cousin and the host and like they would periodically just come up like up to my face and be like, are you having fun? <laughs> like they would just, they were just screaming at me, you know, it's like, are you know, are, is everything okay? You know, but I'm just like, I don't want to drink. I'm having a good time. I don't know any of these songs. Oh my God. I'm totally happy, you know, but, uh, but, but because I wasn't jumping around and singing these songs they they look at me like I'm a like I'm a and what I've eventually started surmise and you tell me if I'm wrong that I was like the stuck up american oh no 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 first of all let me put a parenthesis just so you know as a little bit of context uh on one of the days where we were uh, uh at my grandma's place I found out the next day that my aunt Maritza was worried that I was not having a great time enough because she's like, you know, is Beto not having a good enough time? You know, it's so like they're, they, I think they're very obsessed with making sure that we just have the best time possible, right? So I think in their minds, 
they're just trying to be like the best hosts possible. And so, but do you think there's okay? I, I believe you, but yeah. do you think there's any element of there's an American? Who, you know, it's sort of rare. Like yeah. for me, if I was hosting a party and it was yeah. all my friends and there was one Colombian, sure, I, I would, I would, I would be kind of focused on him. Of like, I hope he has a good time because I hope we represent yeah, America right. well enough for him and make him feel welcome. Or I don't know. Right. I think that's the that's the main factor. But I don't think, I don't think, there would have been a feeling. Well, because I also know you and I know how you would have been in that moment. So I don't think the feeling would have been like, oh, he's being stuck up. It's more like, well, I got that attitude. Like your okay. your cousin um, or your uncle or okay. what was his name? Uh, the guy who lives with your grandparents. Tito. Well, he doesn't live there, but he was visiting. Oh, okay. Tito, Tito. yeah. Uh, what's his full name? Armando. Armando, right. Anyway, so he was very... Um, he, he almost... He, he was basically communicating to me a number of times that, like, Kirk, like, why aren't you having a good time? Do you know what oh, I mean? Oh, really? Like, like, that kind of attitude. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, like, what's wrong with you? What is wrong with you? Like, how, like do we... What do you need? Like, how come you're not having a good time? And 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 I and I, I you know I had a lot of time to think about that because I'm <laughs> listening to these Spanish songs and I'm like, what oh, is it? Ab- right, because he was there too and he was also blitz. Right. So the whole okay. time I'm thinking, what can I do to communicate to all of these okay, okay. Colombians that I'm having a good time, yeah. or at the very least I'm not having a bad time? Yeah. But what am I supposed to do? Like, I can't sing along with the songs. Right. Um. And I just have to sit here and smile, which I was doing the whole time. Like, hey. Oh eh. <laughs> so, so eventually I'm like, okay, I am, because I'm the sort of person when I see a show, I want to be in the front row. Right. I want to I wanna be right there. Like whenever it, I go yeah. see a, a band, I go right up to the stage and right. I stand right there because it's like, why? Why not? Like I want to yeah. I want to see. I want full picture. I don't want to be behind people yeah. if, I could, if it could be helped. So, so since I was the first one in that condo, I sat right in front right. of that singer and I realized that I was too visible. So after a while, like two hours into it, I just, I kind of escaped to the back of the room. <laughs> so now I'm in the back of the room and, I, and I'm like, okay, now everyone is drunk and in front of me uh-huh. and, I, and I'm, now I'm a wallflower. Like no one's really paying right. attention to me. And then uh, all of a sudden this, the Cuban singer, oh, so your cousin, um, uh, his girlfriend arrives and her name is Angelica or something, yeah. right? And, or Angie. Angie, yeah. And so the Cuban singer uh, goes, you know, introduces, they introduce Angie. And he's like, oh, Angie. Oh, I actually said, because I, I always do that when she arrives. Oh. So go, Angie. And then he knew it, so he starts playing. Right, it. so he starts yeah. playing the Rolling Stones song, Angie. He just kind of riffs just for a second. Right. He doesn't play the full song. I now realize, I know this song. Right. So I'm like... Okay, I can now show to all right. these drunken idiots that I can have fun. I can have fun too. Uh-huh. So I belt out, Angie, <laughs> Angie. You know, like, and, now every head turns to me. <laughs> and I hoped that some of them would realize, like, okay, I, you know, I was just waiting for a song. I yeah. Um, everyone turns to me, and like the, the singer included on the stage says, Get up here! Get and up s- here and sing! <laughs> and I'm like, what? No. <laughs> one, like you're only trying to like check off a box. Yeah. One, now- <laughs> no, I don't want to be on stage. Two, that's the only part of the song I <laughs> I know. I don't know any other words. Like I'm not that familiar with that yeah, song, yeah. you know. And I barely know that part, you yeah. know. So, so um, I'm like, no, 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 that's not going to happen. But they, but they drag they me drag on. And then I sit down. I'm like, okay, fine. This is going to be disastrous. But, but at least you're you're like, okay, well, let's get it over with. Right. I'm like, okay, I'll <laughs> I'll, I'll sort of power through it <laughs> with a smile. I can prove to everyone like I'm not a stuck up right. gringo. I can I can hang. I can hang. And 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 so I sit down. I'm like, okay, fine. The drunken host <laughs> decides in this moment to uh, go on some kind of soliloquy. Yeah, like so, some lecture about. I don't even know what. So I think looking back, because I was the only sober one in the room, that he wanted to communicate to me that Colombians know how to have fun. Like he okay. he won. That was his thesis. That okay. was his you know his main point was he 
If there was a TED Talk, that's what it that's would be it called. Would okay. Colombians know how to have fun. And he wanted me to know. Like, okay. it wasn't that, because he didn't have to tell anyone else. Right. But he wanted me. So he was lecturing you. <laughs> he was lecturing me in front of everyone else <laughs> that Colombians know how to have fun. I'm glad you knew what it was about, because I just kept like, I don't know what he's saying. Well, so eventually he got to the phrase, like, literally 15 minutes in, he, he eventually okay. got to the phrase, essence of life. Oh. Actually, I helped with him. He was okay. like trying to say something. And I was like, uh, uh, do you mean essence? essence? And he's like, yeah, <laughs> essence of life. And like, how long? Like, I was on stage while this guy is. No, he talked for like for like 15 minutes. Yeah. Like, it was crazy. And the, the, and, singer, and the singer was wait, ready, ready to like play. Not only that, but the singer, the Cuban guy, the guy on the, who should have the microphone, is occasionally trying to grab the microphone. Yes. From and so it. is the guy's brother. Like, like violently. Yeah. And like, not a joke. Not like, ah, ha, ha. Like, they were like, dude, get off the stage. Yeah. Give the mic to Kirk so he can yeah. sing this stupid song. And his song. brother's trying to do that too. Right. <laughs> so I'm sitting there and at, and at a certain point, I'm like, man, I need a drink for this. You know, like, like yeah. I'm like, this is getting out of control. I need that rum drink yeah. back. So I get up to go get the rum drink. Yeah. And he misunderstands it as I'm like trying to escape. And he violently grabs me. Do you remember oh, this? Oh, no, I don't remember that. He, he didn't just kind of grab uh -huh. me. He grabbed me hard. Oh, wow. And he grabbed me by the, uh, the, by the, the... By the clothes. Okay. And yanked me back to oh, the... Oh, no. And it, like, it, it, like yeah. he stretched my jacket oh, my God. fabric. Do you know what I mean? It yeah. was just like, it was violent. It sits me down. And I'm just like, ugh. I, that, the one sort of solace I could get was like, <laughs> exactly. maybe if I get half that I'm rum freaking. drink down me, I can cope with this situation. Yeah, you're like... Yeah, so, so then finally he hands me the mic and I, I he, butcher yeah. uh, the, the Rolling Stones song. No, no, no. I no, did. I was there. Everyone really enjoyed it. I was like, oh, you really can sing. And, and Angelica was checking her phone the whole time. <laughs> 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 no, I thought it was fun. But yes... I was, we were all suffering along with you because we're like, dude, let him sing. But you weren't on stage. I know. Uh, okay, last few notes here is, um, but but to summarize that whole thing was, that was a glorious night. Yeah. And, <laughs> and while it was happening, I was like, I'm never going to forget this moment. <laughs> like, uh, this is going to be one of those moments yeah. that you never forget. Cause, right. Because it's like you're in a condo with like, Southern Colombians, right, listening to a private concert with this Cuban guy, right, who's amazing, who escaped from Cuba via Canada. Oh, I didn't even know that. Yeah, you, you see, that was another thing. It was all in Spanish. All oh, right, lots of talk, lots of speeches, oh, right. lots of like back and forth with the Cuban singer. So and, you didn't even know that backstory. No. Oh my god. No. no. Uh, anyway, so last little thing here: um, Confederate flags in Colombia. What? You don't remember that? Wait, 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 wait. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Are you talking about the Dukes of Hazard? Yeah. Well, one, I saw a Confederate flag on someone's car, like like in the, like oh. a sticker. And then I saw... Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I remember you, we, we, we talked about that. And then I saw a General Lee car from Dukes of Hazard yes, that has, you know, that. The, yeah. the Confederate flag yes. on. It's called the General Lee, for crying out loud. It has no context there of anything other than Dukes of Hazard. But, but is the, that no, it? But, no, but that's the car we saw... May in fact have been some sort of gringo, with, with. But weird why tendencies. would I have seen a Confederate flag, just independent of the General Lee on someone's car? That's what I'm saying. That car, uh, that might have been from someone who is from the states and actually uh, is weird. Uh, or something. But but the General Lee, I mean, Dukes of Hazard were very popular in the 80s in Colombia. Interesting. Everyone so, knew the Dukes of Hazard. So it's based on that. And they haven't eradicated it because they don't associate it with... I, I, I'm sure the current generations have no idea. Although that movie did come out. Yeah. So I don't know. Interesting. So that's the end of my notes, Berto. Yeah, it was... It was uh, Like, personally, I was very delighted that you went. I had a blast. Um, it was a very different type of trip for those first few days for me because it was like... I also felt the responsibility of like, well, I got to make sure, you know, Kirk sees some stuff. Like I would have never gone to the gold museum, right. but I did. And it was great because I hadn't been since I was a kid. Yeah. 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 I'd be the same if I wouldn't go to the space deal right. unless, you know. Um, or the flea market. I'd never been to the flea market. Yeah. That was pretty cool. Yeah. 
Um, well, thanks for taking me. Yeah. Um, I know it was, you know, uh, and uh, it, I mean, I know you had fun, but it was, you know, it was inconvenient to. It was a little extra work, but yes, yeah, it, was, it was definitely worth to it. To have to, you know, coordinate with me and worry right. about me and, you know, wonder <laughs> what's happening. But, uh, but it was such a great, you know, when I came back, people were like, oh, how was Bogota? The, the main message I would tell everyone was, I got to see the real Bogota. Right. Like if you just were a tourist, like you would, you'd go to the flea market, you go to the gold museum, you'd go to some other museum and you'd, yeah. you'd walk the streets, you'd go to a restaurant. But I was in a grandma's house yeah. who grew up in Bogota and worked for the senator in yeah. Bogota. And, the, and you know, and, uh, what did your grandpa do? He was a prosecutor. Okay. Yeah, in the in the justice. Team. And all her knickknacks and the food and the food that your grandma made was so amazing. I mean, you know, people say that, but your grandma's food was le- with the help of the maid. Maybe yeah, it was yeah. like legitimately really good. Yeah, you she's know? always been like yeah. The barbecue we had at the at the uh, birthday party. Right, and, right. And all the all the booze that was always being served <laughs> to everybody all the time, and and uh, you know just just absorbing the family atmosphere of right. what it is really like and what people really do and what they really eat right. and you know uh the vibe of that whole thing you know i just felt really special to yeah because you know when you go to a foreign country you're like you can see the locals doing things and you're like oh what right i wonder what it's like <laughs> to hang out in their house you know like yeah. i had that experience but if, i mean you'd have to spend time there to meet someone to get invited to you know right here it's like you you, you got the insider's tour right yeah yeah and so a lot of times I was just observing a lot of that, right. you know, like, like your grandpa had a hammock in the middle of mm-hmm. the dining room area or like the off kitchen area. Yeah. And it's some traditional hammock from the coast area that he's from or something. Right. Yeah. And it, just this giant hammock, you know, that people <laughs> like to be in and stuff. And just all these little nuances of everything was just really cool. Yeah. So thanks for taking me, bro. Of course. You're welcome. Um, so uh, if you ever want to come to Seattle and uh, you know, I could show you oh, around. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah. You can take me to the local hotspots. Well, that does it for that <laughs> episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining us out there. Please take care of yourself because... Lo mereces.